Adrian and Breitfelder, City Clerk. You are hereby directed to call a regular session of the City Council to be held on Monday, June 6, 2022, at 6.30 p.m. in the historic Federal Building for the purpose of conducting such business that may properly come before the City Council. Thank you. Good evening, and welcome to a regular session of the Dubuque City Council for June 6, 2022. As a reminder to our participants, you can provide in-person input or virtual audio and written input during the sections of the agenda where public input is accepted. Input options during the live meeting include, in-person attendees may approach the podium when the mayor pro tem asks if there is any public input on the item they would like to speak to. Remote attendees can log into GoToMeeting using the login links, phone numbers, and access code that appear on the broadcast and live stream and posted on the front page of the meeting agenda. This option includes audio input and written chat input. If you are participating via computer, indicate which item you would like to speak to in the chat function or note that you would like to speak during the appropriate section. If you are participating via phone, indicate which item you would like to speak to when phone lines are unmuted. All phone lines will be unmuted during the consent agenda, public hearings, and public input periods, and city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. All comments, whether in person or virtual, must be accompanied by a name and address. Additionally, written public input is accepted by contacting the city council directly from the city's webpage at www.cityofdubuque.org slash council contacts, and through the city clerk's office email at ctyclerk at cityofdubuque.org. This information will be reiterated during the meeting. Attendance for the session is as follows. Mayor Pro Tem Resnick. Here. Mayor Kavanaugh. Here. Council members Farber. Here. Roussel. Here. Sprank. Here. Wethel. Here. City Manager Van Milligan. Here. City Attorney Brumwell. Here. Thank you. And Mayor Pro Tem Resnick, I will turn it over to you for the Pledge of Allegiance. I invite all who are able to stand and join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Ms. Breitfelder. Under swearing in, we have swearing in Police Chief Jensen. I, Jeremy Jensen, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution, that I will support the Constitution of the United States, of the United States, and the Constitution, and the Constitution of the State of Iowa, of the State of Iowa, and that I will faithfully, and that I will faithfully, and impartially, and impartially, to the best of my ability, to the best of my ability, discharge all the duties, discharge all the duties of the office of police chief, of the office of police chief, as now. As now, or hereafter, or hereafter, required by law. Required by law. Congratulations. Thank you. Would you like to have some pictures taken? Absolutely. Yeah. Gotta do it. Not very often we do this. I'm going to tell them I want to be in our family picture. You can be. If you're going to do pictures, I get to be in the family picture. Okay. You can be on this side. That's fine. If you like it, it's fine. <laughs> Thank you. Is swearing in Fire Chief Scheller? Amy 
if you would raise your right hand and repeat after me. I state your name. I, Amy Scheller. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will support the Constitution. That I will support the Constitution. Of the United States. Of the United States. And the Constitution. And the Constitution. Of the State of Iowa. Of the State of Iowa. And that I will faithfully. And that I will faithfully. And impartially. And impartially. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. Discharge all the duties. Discharge all the duties. Of the Office of Fire Chief. Of the Office of Fire Chief. As now. As now. Or hereafter. Or hereafter. Required by law. Required by law. Congratulations, Amy. Very good. Uh, Ms. Breitfelder. Next under presentations, our first presentation is the Golden Post Award finalist for Best LinkedIn Presence, and Ariana Donnelly is virtually attending to present. All right. Thank you, Ms. Donnelly. Thank you so much for having me today. My name is Ariana Donnelly. I'm a web and social media specialist for Government Social Media, LLC. I was also honored to present awards during the Golden Post Award Ceremony this year. Now this ceremony was part of the government social media conference in Dallas, which also had a virtual audience with more than 1200 people attending. So the reason I'm telling you this is because the Golden Post Awards are a very prestigious recognition for government social media professionals involving 10 very competitive award categories. Now during the awards ceremony, the city of Dubuque was recognized as a finalist in the best LinkedIn presence category, thanks to hard work from your very own communication specialist, Trevor Fannett. It's my honor to be here today to formally recognize Trevor's commitment to government social media with a finalist certificate commending his efforts and devotion to a unique LinkedIn presence for your city. Now, this means representatives of LinkedIn also saw your work. They've been encouraging government agencies to show their personality and build trust with their communities. When I looked at your page, I personally was impressed by all of the unique videos you've incorporated onto your page, which have also gained hundreds and even thousands of views. And you're doing just that, showing personality and building trust. Congratulations and thank you so much for inviting government social media to join you tonight to formally recognize this achievement and your commitment to innovative uses of social media to communicate with the public that you choose to serve. Thank you very much and Trevor Fannin. Uh, I want to show the public first what the uh, what they're getting, uh, what you'll be getting as a certificate for this award. And I don't know if we're able to get this. Uh, I hope, hopefully we've got this. But I want to congratulate you. Thank you very much. Yes. Mr. Rare, if you wouldn't mind, if I could just mention, uh, Trevor finished only second to Tampa, Florida. So it was some pretty heady competition. Congratulations, Trevor. Yes, congratulations. Thank you. Spritefelder. Our second presentation is Anderson Sanchi Individual Governor's Volunteer Service Award, and Adam Lounsbury is virtually attending to present. Mr. Lounsbury. <laughs> Is, uh, it, do we have the connection? Otherwise, uh, Anderson's gonna have to present it to himself. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like there might be some audio issues. We'll just give it one more moment. Go ahead, Adam, if you're ready. Oh, sorry, I got bumped off for a second. I had to log back on, so 
apologies for that. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and definitely honored to be here and, and recognize a couple great volunteers for the state of Iowa. 20, 2022 mark, marks the 39th anniversary of the Governor's Volunteer Awards. Uh, engaging volunteers is critical to meeting Iowa's toughest, Iowa's toughest challenges, and we believe that Iowans are what makes Iowa special. Neighbors helping neighbors are at the core of community. Both Anderson Sanche and Tessa Strom demonstrated that spirit of service, so we are pleased to be able to recognize them as recipients of the Governor's Volunteer Award. Tessie is serving her fourth, her fourth and final year with the City of Dubuque's AmeriCorps Creating Opportunities Program in partnership with the Multicultural Family Center. She has served as a teen empowerment specialist since 2019. Tessie served 4,000 hours during her four years with AmeriCorps. She consistently provides daily enrichment and social emotional learning and support. Whether it, it is the daily task of data collection or invaluable re relationships with each and every teen that feels heard having known her, Tessie shows up. Tessie is always there to offer her help and continues to invest in, in her peers and community at large. Anderson could have been nominated for Governor's Volunteer Award for many reasons. An AmeriCorps alum himself, he was appointed to the Iowa Commission on Volunteer Service in 2016 by Governor Branstad and reappointed by Governor Reynolds in 2019. Anderson challenged the commission to make sure we serve, or make sure we make service accessible to and benefiting all islands. He kickstarted our DEI committee, which led to several tangible impacts for Iowa, including a new leadership council for AmeriCorps members, a fellows program to support underrepresented islands help develop and bring new programming to their organizations and communities, a DEI mentoring circle for nonprofit staff of color, a governor-initiated grant program to support minority-led and focused nonprofits during the pandemic. He also challenges to be data-driven and go where the need was in our grant making. Mm -hmm. So Anderson's term with the commission will come to an end in July, but his legacy will live on and continue to make Iowa a better and more welcoming place. So we congratulate and thank both of them uh, for their important work that they do. And, their dedication and their passion. So thank you on behalf of, of Iowa and, and uh, uh, the, the Governor's Volunteer Awards. Thank you very much. So both Tessie and Anderson received an award and it says uh, the State of Iowa Governor's Volunteer Award for Outstanding Volunteer Service. Uh, the State of Iowa hereby acknowledges you and it is signed by the Governor and Lieutenant Governor. So Tessie, how about uh, come and get your award and congrats. And of course, Anderson Sansi. Thank you. So Ms. Breitfeller. Presentation number four is the COVID-19 update. Good evening. Good evening. Mayor Pro Tem Resnick and council members. Um, last time I gave a report was early May. So here's what's been going on in the last month with COVID-19. And um, as many people would wish to say it's over, it's not. So oh, let me get the presentation up there. Here we go. Are we good, Adrian? I mean, I'm good, but okay, there we go. Mm -hmm. Okay, so as you can see, um, since March or April 2020, we've had several waves, peaks and valleys, and most recently since April, we've been on an upward um, trajectory as well, with the number of cases increasing. And that increase has been due to the Omicron variant which since, Mar since February has um, dominated the cases um, in Dubuque County and in Iowa. Now, these are all the, var the different variants of COVID that have happened, and I know this slide is messy, um, but it's meant to illustrate how complicated this can be. And as one variant decreases, as did Delta and BA2 and BA.5, those lines went down, you can see that the Omicron subvariants of BA 2.1, 2.1, and BA 2 are going up. And we know that the longer transmission 
keeps going um, will increase the chances of more variants and subvariants um, occurring. So I did a longer trend line this month to illustrate where we've come since the beginning of August, and you can see a, a rather steep trajectory. These are seven-day numbers of cases, and once again, these are only the cases that are being done at healthcare providers and clinics. These are not at-home test kits, the rapid kind. These do include the Test Iowa mail-in kits. So our, last week, our, um, on Wednesday, this is updated every week on a statewide basis. We are at 139 cases in the last seven days, and when I checked the numbers today on our public health website, we are at 162. Um, this may go down a little bit when we report officially out on Wednesday based on the weekend counts. Um, the good news is our hospitalizations are staying um, stable um, over the past month, and we continue to um, check in with the hospitals, make sure they have capacity. Um, and they continue to be busy with a lot of things um, besides COVID. Our community level, as described by the CDC, has been bouncing around a little bit. Um, it was at low for a very long time, and over the last two weeks, we've jumped up to medium a couple times. And this, is, this metric um, gives the picture of the effects on the healthcare providers, particularly hospitalizations, and the percentage of staffed uh, inpatient beds in use by COVID patients confirmed with um, COVID-19 in our local hospitals. So, um, these metrics did push us up into the medium category. And basically, what that means for citizens, that it means that if you have symptoms, you should definitely get tested. Whether or not you've had COVID before or whether or not you've been immunized. You should wear a mask if you have symptoms or a positive test or you've been exposed to someone with COVID-19. You should wear a mask on public transportation and anytime you want to protect yourself with extra precautions. And if you're at high risk for severe illness, you should consider wearing a mask in all indoor public places and gathering areas, along with having a plan for rapid testing should you become symptomatic or have an exposure and stay in touch with your healthcare provider. These um, community levels are updated uh, weekly. So, Who's had COVID? Um, there was a recent study put out by CDC on the seroprevalence, which measured and kept track of people who tested positive. So in the US between September 2021 and February 2022, the seroprevalence increased from 33.5% to almost 58% nationally. And there was a big jump in young children and um, teenagers, younger uh, adults. Um, all the age groups increased in seroprevalence. In Iowa, it is estimated, based on these laboratory um, studies, that about 70% of the citizens have been infected at some point. So there's a lot of um, new campaigns um, that we'll be taking advantage of and uh, social media and publicity about um, continuing to vaccinate uh, teenagers, young children, and soon to be hopefully ch age zero to five children um, if that vaccine gets fully approved by CDC sometime this month. And in fact, um, the state is having our local vaccine providers order that vaccine for the children and have it ready when it does get approved. So we are anticipating that. I don't have new numbers to report on vaccinations. The uh, Iowa Department of Public Health went to updating their vaccination website monthly, and they haven't done it yet for June. Um, these numbers will go up maybe a couple percentage points, not a lot. We're seeing um, there will probably be more percentage points going up in boosters as some of those age groups have opened up. Um, but it's an incremental, small, steady climb, basically. Um, the healthcare providers continue to offer vaccines, so do our retail outlets, and the VNA continues their walk-in clinics on most Mondays and Fridays. So as I mentioned, um, 
we, we want to emphasize the importance of vaccination for children and teens. Um, and we, we want to prevent them from severe disease. Children can get hospitalized and have severe outcomes. Um, and we know that we do have a lot of immunocompromised children um, in our community. And there's no way to tell in advance how COVID-19 will affect a child. So however healthy they are, or if they have underlying health conditions, um, these vaccinations are highly recommended. And now um, boosters can be obtained too, especially if the children are immunocompromised. So will I get COVID-19 again? A question I have. Um, again, new studies and data coming out show that fully vaccinated and those previously infected with SARS-CoV-2 or the virus that causes COVID-19 each have a low risk of subsequent infection for about six months. However, early reinfection within 90 days can occur and there's no approved test to reliably determine if you're immune or currently protected. Um, antibody and testing is highly complex and expensive and takes more than one test and um, nobody's come up with the gold standard determine, to determine immunity at this point. Um, so reinfection with the SARS-CoV-2 with the same virus variant as the initial infection or with a different variant are both possible. So you could be infected with Omicron BA2 and then again with BA 1.12.2. <laughs> Did I get that right, Katie? Um, <laughs> symptoms um, during reinfection are less likely to be severe. Um, but again, that depends on the person. So yes, the bottom line is you can get COVID more than once, unfortunately. One thing, I, um, we haven't been under a state public health uh, emergency proclamation since February, but we still are under federal emergency proclamations. And um, one thing to remember is there's a lot of things um, that are in place because of that proclamation. The current one ends sometime in mid-July, but here is just a list of the things that would go away if we didn't have that federal proclamation because it's taking care of um, coverage and costs and payment for COVID testing, treatments, and vac vaccines. Um, it's helping with Medicaid coverage and Medicare coverage for telehealth. Um, it's providing other private insurance coverage flexibilities. Um, it's also doing access to med medical countermeasures through the FDA Emergency Use Authorization Program, and it's limiting immunity, it's liability immunity to administer medical countermeasures for um, healthcare providers, which is very important. So I, th I think um, uh, we, t we take advantage of all of these things uh, locally in our community, and we know how important um, testing, vaccination, and treatments are and having access to them. And I'll just give you one non-COVID piece of information because I'm sure everybody wants to know the latest and greatest on our uh, newly re-emerging infection, uh, monkeypox which is happening now in over, it's probably more than 12 states. I checked that this morning, but it's um, fortunately probably more. more. So um, it's probably been 10 or so years at least when we, this surfaced previously in the United States and now it's back. But it is uh, in the family of smallpox and creates um, fever, malaise, general illness and um, uh, a very significant rash in some people. And it is spread um, through, it's a zoonotic disease, meaning animals can spread it to humans, humans to humans, and humans to animals. Uh, most of the US 25 cases have involved international travel. And the map on there indicates the states that have been infected. If, if we compare um, the monkey pox outbreak to uh, the COVID outbreak, it's far below 
um, the concern of the pandemic status, although a pandemic can happen without the huge number of cases, it simply means worldwide spread. So we do have to um, make sure our healthcare providers know how to watch for this, and those alerts have, have gone out. Um, the other tricky thing about monkeypox is most people practicing medicine today haven't seen smallpox nor monkeypox, and it, it can be mistaken for other things. So that's the information I have to you to, for tonight, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, do we have any questions from the table? Mr. Mayor, do you have any comments or questions? I actually don't have any questions tonight. Thank you very much. Okay, Mary thank Rose. you. Mr. Mayor, Mr. You and Ms. Farber. So, Mary Rose, the um, additional booster that has now become available, do you have information as to how many of our citizens have actually had that second booster or the third booster, depending on one's perspective? Yes, I do. Um, well, I have it for 12 plus. The data hasn't been updated yet. For those 12 and older, 57 percent who are fully vaccinated have received a booster dose. So um, hopefully it'll be coming out and I can, I can send that out or for sure it'll be on next month's update. And it's still readily available for those that want that second booster. Is yes, that we have okay, plenty of you. vaccine in the community. Um, and like I said, we're, we're getting it for the zero to five in anticipation of that being approved. So um, no vaccine shortage issues at all. Okay, thank you very much, and I think that's an important message for folks to, to be aware of. Thank you. Agreed. Thank you. Yeah. I was going to ask about the if you could characterize the Omicron virulence, but part of what you said was that it really is an individual, how it reacts with an individual is unpredictable. So are they able to say that uh, they're able to characterize the virulence as... Um, very strong, or it's uh, is much less than other uh, than other COVID nineteen. Uh. Well, I think um, the fact that our hospitalizations continue to remain low, and um, during the month of May we had four deaths, and the previous several months the deaths have been, you know, below five each month. So that indicates less severe disease, and that's a direct result of vaccinations and um, increased immunity in the community. So um, in general, yes, it is. Um, you do not tend to get as severely ill with Omicron, um, but yet again, it's an individual thing. But that is the good thing out of this outcome and our efforts of vaccination um, and the seroprevalence rate of those infected have um, decreased the severity of the illness. So it may be less virulent, but we should remain vigilant. Uh, uh, yes, the transmission rate is, uh, the CDC transmission rate for us is high. That's a number that healthcare providers um, use in their planning, and so it continues to be high. That hasn't let up since the first part of April. Great. Well, thank you very much for your report for us You're tonight. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Breitfelder. We will move on to proclamations. Our first proclamation is Men's Health Month. Of Men's Health Month. Yes, I, I believe we have, is Pam McCarran here? Yes. Whoa. And who else is with you? Um, hello, my name is Pamela McCarran, and this is Joe Meserich, and we are members of the city's wellness committee. The wellness committee's mission is to help improve the wellness of employees and their families by promoting healthy lifestyle choices and observances such as Men's Health Month. Throughout the year, the committee offers challenges that consist of an activity and brain health component. We also meet to discuss and establish policies relative to physical and mental wellness. We thank you for this opportunity to talk briefly about the Wellness Committee and accept the proclamation on behalf of the Wellness Committee. Yes, thank you for coming tonight. So City of Dubuque Proclamation. Whereas, despite advances in medical technology and research, men continue to live an average of five years less than women, with Native American and African American men having the lowest life expectancy, and COVID-19 variants continue to spread across the country, and the Centers for Disease Control reporting that males are more likely to die from this pandemic, and 
Encouraging safe behaviors, including social distancing, wearing masks, and being vaccinated will help stop the spread of COVID-19. And educating the public and health care providers about the importance of a healthy lifestyle and early detection of male health problems will result in reducing rates of mortality from disease. And men who are educated about the value that preventative health can play in prolonging their lifespan and their role as productive family members are more likely to participate in health screenings. And Men's Health Network worked with Congress to develop a national men's health awareness period as a special campaign to help educate men, boys, and their families about the importance of positive health attitudes and preventative health practices. Now, therefore, I, David Resnick, Mayor Pro Tem of the City of Dubuque, on behalf of the City Council staff and residents of Dubuque, to hereby proclaim this month of June 2022 as Men's Health Month in the City of Dubuque, and encourage all our residents to pursue preventative health practices and early detection efforts throughout the year. Our second proclamation is Pride Month. Thank you very much. And uh, I have perhaps uh, receiving the proclamation is Indy Channing, Annie, uh, and Danny Sprank. Are you good? All right. So you're um, invited to give some comments if you would, if you could introduce yourselves. We know Danny. <laughs> um. Yeah, so yeah, just thank you once again for showing solidarity and support with the local LGBTQ community. And also we would love to see anybody at the uh, Pride picnic on the 25th. That'll be down at the Port of Dubuque from noon to three that day, so. All right. Thank you. All right, well again, thank you for coming to receive this proclamation. Dubuque, City of Dubuque proclamation. The city of Dubuque is a progressive and inclusive community that celebrates culture and heritage and supports efforts to ensure everyone has the right to live in conditions of dignity, respect, and peace. And the city of Dubuque strives to offer our residents a safe community and to put an end to taunting, bullying, and intolerance. And the city of Dubuque advocates for the elimination of all forms of discrimination and displays a commitment to the equal treatment of all people. We recognize the need for intersectionality and work towards social justice, as we understand there is no true equality until there is equity for all. And the city of Dubuque understands the importance of LGBTQ plus people to have access to excellent health care in LGBTQ uh, affirmative environments. The necessity to have the legal and institutional freedom to pursue their own lives as they wish and the need to have their freedom and desire affirmed by the rest of the world. And this proclamation in and of itself sends a positive message of validation to LGBTQ plus residents of Dubuque and the city embraces these individuals and their families as a part of the community. Now, therefore, I, David Resnick, Mayor Pro Tem of the City of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council staff and residents of Dubuque, do hereby proclaim the month of June 2022 as, LG, as LGBTQ plus Pride Month in the City of Dubuque and call upon the residents of Dubuque to observe this month with appropriate programs, activities, and ceremonies in recognition of our city's diversity. Our third proclamation is World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. Thank you very much. Is uh, Stacy Spears here? Hello. So 
Good evening. I am Stacy Spears. I'm with Northeast Iowa Area Agency on Aging. And on behalf of our agency, I'm so thankful that you have chosen to recognize June 15th as World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. Unfortunately, every year in America, one in 10 older adults, which is defined as adults age 60 and older, experience some sort of abuse, whether that be physical, emotional, sexual, or neglect or financial exploitation. And so World Elder Abuse Day is really a chance for everybody, um, no matter how old we are, to get together and to come across with communities across the world to talk about elder abuse, raise awareness, and really express our opposition to a violence towards our older adults. Yes, thank you, and thank you for coming to accept this proclamation. City of Dubuque Proclamation. Whereas Dubuque's older adults deserve to be treated with respect and dignity to enable them to continue to serve as leaders, mentors, volunteers, and vital participating members of our community. And one in 10 seniors in the United States experience maltreatment or abuse. And because these incidents are vastly underreported, they do not get the help they need. Abuse of seniors is an ever-increasing problem in today's society that crosses all socioeconomic boundaries. And combating abuse of older adults will help improve the quality of their life for all seniors across the state and nation and will allow seniors to continue to live independently as possible and contribute to the life and vibrance of the city of Dubuque. And Preventing elder abuse may be accomplished by strengthening the aging network through providing services, spreading awareness, education, and advocating for policies to protect the aging population. And we are all responsible for building safer communities for Dubuque seniors. And our theme this year is Aging My Way, Equality for All. We believe that it is important to educate older Iowans on their rights, to expand access to services for all survivors of elder abuse, to better assist them to live independently in their homes and community as long as possible. Now, therefore, I, David Resnick, Mayor Pro Tem of the City of Dubuque, Iowa, on behalf of the City Council staff and residents of Dubuque, do hereby proclaim the 15th of June, 2022, as World Elder Abuse Awareness Day in the City of Dubuque. Breitfelder. We will move on to consent items. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss one of the consent items, please approach the podium when the mayor pro tem asks if there is any in-person input and state your name and address. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor pro tem asks if there is any virtual input. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Please state the item you would like removed from the consent agenda for separate discussion and consideration. And consent items can be found on pages two through six of the agenda. Thank you. Uh, do we have any members of the public present in the chambers who wish to hold an item from the consent agenda for separate consideration? Uh, do we have any virtual input? No virtual input. I'll bring it back to the table. Do we have a motion at all? Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Yes, Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file and adopt the resolutions and deal with the items as recommended. Second by Farber. We have a, a motion by Ms. Roussel and a second by Farber. Ms. Breitfelder, please call the roll. Resnick. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Farber. Aye. Uh, the motion passes six to zero. We will move on to items set for public hearing, and we have one FY 2023 annual action plan set for public hearing for July 5th, 2022. Uh, Mr. Mayor, or Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Sorry. Yes. Mr. Frank. Uh, I motion that we uh, set the public hearing for July 5th for this, uh, this item. 
Do we have a second? Second by Wethel. Thank you very much. So we have a motion by Sprank and a second by Wethel. Uh, Ms. Breitfelder, please call the roll. Um, Pardon? Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. I was just going to say, can we do a friendly amendment to that to say at the time um, outlined in the resolution? No, 6.30. So. A date and time usually is oh, what we say. July, July 5th at 6.30. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Yeah, I, I believe too that um, on the agenda that the suggested disposition is to receive and file and adopt the resolution as well. Okay. All right, receive and file, adopt the resolution and set the public hearing for July 5th, uh, 2022 at 6.30. Uh, would you second that? Second by Wethel. All right, thank you everybody for that uh, participation. We do have a motion by Sprank and a second by Wethel. Uh, now, Ms. Breitfelder, if you would please call the roll. Resnick? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Farber? Aye. Uh, that motion passes six to zero. We'll move on to boards and commissions. We have applicant review for the Arts and Cultural Affairs Advisory Commission, the Civic Center Advisory Commission, the Equity and Human Rights Commission, the Historic Preservation Commission, the Investment Oversight Advisory Commission, the Library Board of Trustees, the Parks and Recreation Advisory Commission, and the Resilient Community Advisory Commission. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, we'll do this uh, one Board of Commission at a time. Is there anyone in the chambers who would like to speak to the applications uh, for the Arts and uh, Cultural Affairs Advisory Commission? If so, please come to the mic, give us your name and address, and make your comments. Good evening. My name is Shirley Davis Orwall. I reside at 2635 West 32nd Street here in Dubuque, Iowa, and I'm applying to fulfill a vacancy on the Arts and Cultural Affairs Commission. I'm a native Dubuquer who became involved in the arts at a very early age. I won't tell you how long ago it was, but I started taking flute lessons at Audubon Elementary School, and from there I was hooked. I continued to be in band, choir, theater, all through high school, received a bachelor's in music education from Clark University, music therapy certification from the University of Iowa, and a master's in music education and music therapy from the University of Kansas. As a music therapist, I've worked with students with special needs and Alzheimer's patients. I've worked with students as a music educator in many Dubuque schools for the last 18 years. Before I took my current position, as um, instructional support leader for the fine arts department that covers um, band, orchestra, choir, general music, speech, and theater. I work daily with many stakeholders from the community to improve and give opportunities for our many great students in our schools. I believe everyone should have access to the arts, and I also believe the experience in my 34 years as an educator and my involvement in arts organizations in Des Moines Council Bluffs in Omaha, Nebraska will be valuable in, in serving on this special commission. Thank you for your time and cons consideration of my application. Ms. Orwell, thank you very much for your application. Good evening, my name is Aaliyah Harian, address 2761 Broadway Street. Um, I am coming forward to you today to apply for the Arts and C uh, Culture Commissions Board as a native Dubuqueer who um, has graduated from the University of Dubuque as an English uh, major and just recently graduated with a Master of Fine Arts at Augsburg University. Um, I have participated in various arts throughout my lifetime, both through school um, and then obviously majoring in it as well, including um, choir, singing, actually songwriting is what made me learn to love writing. <laughs> um, and then recently I have started a nonprofit devoted to the literary arts as well in the area. Um, and so I just request that <laughs> as a young um, up and coming um, person dedicated to giving back to her hometown in that area that she's passionate about, you would consider my application. Thank you. Thank you for your application, Ms. Harian. Hi, Doug Donald, 2920 Arbor Oaks Court. 
Uh, I have over, over 50 years of experience in theater that covers professional, educational, and community environments. Uh, as a working director, actor, I know what it's like to struggle to try to put food on the table and pay your bills simply through your artistic creations. As an educator, I know what it's like to try to give that youthful person their individual artistic voice. And as a co-founder of Fly By Night Productions, a, the a community theater company that will be celebrating its 40th season next year, I know what it's like to work with that individual who is simply there because they have an overwhelming passion and love for the arts. And the passion that that has given me as a director is a passion for collaboration. Uh, I think as a director, you learn to work with many different artists. Uh, you work with actors, you work with all the different designers, set sound, lights, uh, costumes. You have to work with music directors and musicians, choreographers and dancers. You have to work with a fight director, uh, an intimacy director and they all have strong opinions, and they all have multitudes of ideas. And as a director, you have to take all of those and form them into one united, comprehensive, artistic product. And that's one thing I would love to bring to the commission, a sense of collaboration. The second thing I'd like to bring is what I call the lump of coal. And it happens to all of us. We all do it. I do it. Even when I try conscientiously not to do it. But it's when we hear that idea or opinion and our immediate reaction is negative. And so we, without hesitation, toss it out and toss it aside. But I think we find that if we take time to examine the lump of coal and look at it from different perspectives, especially artistic and cultural, and if we can see it through the eyes of another individual, we find out that that lump of coal can provide heat. It can make us a meal. It can filter infected water. Given time, it can be a diamond, something that we can find very valuable. And that's the second thing I would like to bring to the commission is the effort to look at the lump of coal. Uh, I, I would close by quoting Albert Einstein just because I love the man. Uh, Art is standing there extending a hand into the universe and one hand into the world, letting ourselves be the conduit for passing energy. And that's what I would love to be on the commission is an effective conduit. So I don't envy you having to choose from a th this list of wonderful names. Glad I don't have to do it. But thank you for listening. And thank you for your application, Mr. Donald. Do we have others for the Arts and Cultural Advisory Commission? Uh, Ms. Breitfelder, I believe we've gotten some emails as well. Yes, um, all written input has been uh, provided to the uh, City Council and there's no one on the go-to meeting for this commission. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's move on. Uh, uh, to the next, uh, let's go to the Civic Center Advisory Commission. Is there anyone in the chambers who would like to speak to the applications for the Civic Center Advisory Commission? Please give your name and address and uh, then your comments. Thank you. 
Rod Bakke, 3030 Karen Street, Dubuque, Iowa. I've graduated from a walker to a cane, so we're making progress. Uh, I'm here tonight, Honorable Mayor Kavanaugh, Honorable Mayor Pro Tem, Honorable Council Members, Honorable City Manager Mike, everybody's honorable in Dubuque, and the honorable city employees. I'm here to announce my desire to be reappointed to the Five Flags Civic Center uh, Commission. Uh, it's a very busy and important time for the center, and I'd sure like to be a part of the uh, program coming up. We have a busy summer and fall schedule, including a great Disney production coming in. Uh, during the past uh, few years, I promoted the future of Five Flags to be put to a vote. And I hope uh, things will work out. There's been talk about coming up in March of next year. But I do propose that we let the folks decide how they want to have the center for the future. Uh, in a democracy, that's the way to do it. Now, democracies are not all perfect, but it's the best thing we have to deal with. And I would love to see the folks of Dubuque turn out to uh, show what they feel about the center. Uh, for you council members, you have wards that you deal with. I think there's one at-large ward. Uh, for a person on a commission, we have the city. And believe you me, over the years, I have heard from people almost every week, uh, both, you know, pro, sometimes con. Uh, one time last fall when I was recovering from surgery in a hospital, I had a call from a constituent. And the person apologized for calling, but they had a serious question. And I said, do you mind if I take this lying down? And he said, no, go ahead. So whether it's after church, in the grocery store, uh, at my grandson's ball games, people want to know about Five Flags. And I guess my name over, I won't say how many years, have been associated with the center, I do get the contact. So I thank you for thinking about me. I'd love to be reappointed to the commission. Uh, not saying it'll be my last one, but depending on how things turn out next year, who knows? Thank you. Well, thank you for your application, uh, Mr. Baki. Is there anyone else for the Civic Center Advisory Commission? And there's a button, a secret button, uh, that you oh, could lower that podium. I'm fine, I like to hide. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name's Brenda Christner. I live at 655 Florence Street. I was just appointed to the commission, oh, maybe less than six months ago, and I find it very invigorating and a very important part of Dubuque that needs to be um, looked at and taken care of. My history is not as a Dubuquer, but from um, another Iowa, um, from Iowa City, just a few miles south. And I've always participated in the community, and I feel it's really important to give back to the community. You just don't walk in and expect it all to be given to you. You need to give back. And that's one of my firm beliefs. I uh, was manager of the Johnson County Fairgrounds for almost 10 years, and a lot of what I did was take care of the buildings and rent them and um, talk about making a, a big investment on a large building. And I think that sort of history that I have can definitely help with deciding um, what should happen to Five Flags. And I, I would feel very comfortable working through that. So thank you for your time. Well, thank you for your application, Ms. Christner. Sure. Anyone else for the Civic Center? Any virtual 
input? No virtual input. All right, thank you very, very much. Uh, next we have, um, uh, is there anyone in the chambers who would like to speak to the applications for the Equity and Human Rights Commission? If you could come up, give your name and address, and make some comments. Hi, I'm Lauren Link, and I live at 535 West 5th Street here in Dubuque. Um, currently, I am a mother. Um, I left the workforce in 2019 uh, to focus on raising my two daughters, who are now 18 and 2. So I have one going off to college, and one I'm working on potty training this, <laughs> this summer, so wish me luck on that. Um, with both my daughters, I've learned some really valuable lessons. Um, I think to understand why I want to volunteer for this position for the commission is to understand my background. I was raised in a low-income family, um, and when I was 20, I brought my daughter into a very similar situation in which I was raised. Um, I didn't have a career. I didn't have education or financial resources. Thankfully, with the help of government programs, I was able to receive medical, housing, um, and food assistance. After several years in the workforce and lots of encouragement from my coworkers, I attended my first class at NICC. And uh, from there, that led me to obtaining both my bachelor's and my master's degrees at Loris. Um, through that process, I experienced the headache of finding decent housing in Dubuque. Um, a lot of the decent housing that was available didn't accept housing vouchers. I struggled with um, doctor's offices hanging up on me because I was on Medicaid. Um, I experienced not knowing what to do with my daughter in the summers because there was no proper daycare providers and I, I made 50 cents too much on the hour to be eligible for daycare at that point. Um, in summary, I want to bring these life experiences that I've had to the table um, to help others. There's a lot I need to learn and understand about being on the commission and a lot I need to learn about what's going on in Dubuque, but I promise to do my best to listen, to be a humble learner, and uh, to make an impact on our community in what ways I can. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you for your application, Ms. Link. Council members, Mayor Pro Tem, everybody else, Carly Anderson, 1131 Main Street. I am asking for a reappointment to the Equity and Human Rights Commission. I've already served once as the vice chair to Mallory Gardner, who's leaving because of graduation. I have run for city council. I have lost city council to my formidable friend now, Ms. Katie Wethall. And I'm now committed to getting her out in the community to meeting, I'm sorry, constituents in the fourth ward. I am dedicated to working within this community and seeing that everyone has human rights equity along the way whether it's in their everyday lives, their lives inside the community, and their jobs. I'm an advocate as well as a member of the LGBTQ community, and I want to have more representation and more boards in the city of Dubuque. I'm asking for reappointment. Thank you. All right, thank you for your application, Ms. Anderson. Anyone else for Equity and Human Rights Commission? Any virtual? Input? No virtual input. All right, thank you. Uh, next, the Historic uh, Preservation Commission. Is there anyone here who would like to be considered for that? Any virtual? No virtual input. Thank you very much. The Investment Oversight Advisory Commission. No, no virtual input. All right, how about the Library Board of Trustees? Thank you very much. This is going to be a mayoral appointment, but I think we all need to hear this. Thank you. My name is Andrew Bland, and I live at 1227 Timberhurst. And uh, I appreciate everyone's time this evening for considering my application for the Library Board of Trustees. Uh, this is my second year here in Dubuque. I came during COVID. Uh, I am a practicing physician at Grand River uh, Medical Group. And uh, before that, uh, I had the opportunity of doing leadership in health systems at the national level. And when COVID happened, uh, I volunteered and went to New York as uh, some of the initial uh, responders out there and decided I needed to come back and practice medicine full time. 
uh, one of the people I went to fellowship with uh, practices here and uh, have come and made my home in Dubuque and very happy and this is going to be where I stay for the rest of my life. I uh, had a chance of doing Distinctively Dubuque where I learned about some of the leadership opportunities and that's kind of what brings me here. Uh, in terms of civic service, um, I became a uh, trustee for a fire protection district, spent seven years, went from trustee to president, went from a fire protection district that was missing 10% of its calls to transitioning from a um, fully volunteer department to a hybrid department to being the only uh, um, bond referendum that passed with 75% for $5 million to be able to build um, uh, three new fire stations within our district. And so I have some experience engaging the public, taking them from skeptic to, uh, to engaged and being able to, to buy in. Why the library? Uh, I am a lifelong learner. Uh, as a physician, I use a library every day to look at articles, to look where, um, to, to understand uh, new and advancing science. Um, personally, um, uh, I am a big enough nerd. I went to school and got a master's in MBA and then a master's in predictive analytics and data science. So I continue to learn on a daily basis. Also, I love teaching. Uh, I am uh, an associate professor of medicine, uh, also uh, on faculty at the University of Dubuque, and love helping learners um, be able to understand medicine. Um, what I'm hoping to do is be able to take that passion uh, for learning and uh, apply it to the library and uh, take that and combine it with uh, my experience with open meetings and public engagement. I appreciate the time and uh, I look forward to uh, speaking more if there are questions. Great. Well, thank you very much for your application. Hello, everyone. I'm Alonda Gregory. I'm 653 White Street. I would love to serve as a library trustee because I am a former employee of the library. So I've seen the insides of the circulation department and seen our community uh, at work. I have experience in cor uh, former corporate executive. I have also established a couple of um, organi organizations. I'm currently the co-founder of the BIPOC Leader and Professional uh, Collective. What I am hoping to bring to the board is a, new, a newer look. Working with the community and seeing the resources that the library provide, there is a lot that the community doesn't, they don't know that, that's there. There's a lot of children that could use the library, a lot of parents that do not know that they can bring their little ones to the library and, and, and enroll in the summer reading program. And there's a lot of, in the urban community, that do not know that as well. They come, they use the library, or they come and sit in the library and not really, they're not fully aware of what's a part of the library. I hope that my experience can show that and serve the public as well as the board to bring and bridge a gap that is missing in our community. That, it, that the library is a very fun place. I grew up around a library. I love, from Chicago. We have the very beautiful library that I used to go to all the time downtown, and I volunteered in the, in the library. So I have a lot of, more than I'm a nerd, I am also an enthusiast, and the library has a lot of resources. They have arts and culture. They are the hub at, for the public to get involved, to come in for the programming, and to get to know the staff. And so I was part of that staff, and I hope to serve on the board to, to continue the work with the community. Thank you all for your, thank you. And thank you for your application, Ms. Gregory. Anyone else for the library? No virtual input. All right, thank you very much. Uh, next, we have the Park and Recreation Advisory Commission. Do we have anyone to speak to that? And no virtual input. And finally, we have the Resilient, uh, Resilient Community Advisory Commission. Do we have anyone to speak to that commission? Right. And no virtual input. Right. And thank you very much uh, to all of those people who, who have applied. And thank you especially to those who have 
come tonight and who have sent us emails or other kinds of communications. We appreciate that. We want to make the best uh, decision possible. Um, Ms. Breifelder. We will move on to public hearings. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting in person who would like to discuss one of the public hearing items, please plan to approach the podium when the Mayor Pro Tem asks if there is any in-person input for the public hearing you would like to speak to. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function and state your question, or state your name and address over the phone when the mayor asks if there is any virtual input for the public hearing you would like to speak to. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Public hearing number one is 32nd Street and Northwest Arterial Rezoning Request. Uh, thank you very much. Tim. Yes, Ms. Roussel. I move to receive and file and further move that the requirement that the proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed be suspended. Second by Sprank. Okay, so we have a, a motion by Roussel and a second by Sprank to receive and file and waive the three readings. Uh, Mr. Van Milligan. In this case, it's coming from the Zoning Commission, so it'll be Wally Wernemont, Planning Services Manager. Mr. Wernemont, uh, I need to say that we are in a public hearing to consider City Council adoption of a resolution amending Title 16 of the City of Dubuque Code of Ordinances Unified Development Code by reclassifying here and after described property located between 32nd Street and Northwest Arterial from AG Agricultural District to R1 Single Family Residential and R4 multifamily. Okay. All right. First, after the report. So, Mr. Wernemont. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem and City Council. Wally Wernemont, Planning Services Manager. Um, I'm here to give a presentation uh, to discuss the rezoning of the property that's located um, between 32nd Street and the Northwest Arterial then at Tiffany Court. Um, as you mentioned, it is a request to rezone from agricultural land to R1 single family residential. And then there are a couple portions of properties that are being requested to be R4 multifamily residential that will be um, located on 32nd Street, which I will pull up and discuss. Um, before I go into greater detail in the presentation, I don't know if anyone had an opportunity to watch the Zoning Advisory Commission meeting. Um, I went into probably a half hour presentation on quite a bit of the, <laughs> the items. Um, I'll go through quite a few of the items that I've touched there and you know, if you had additional questions, don't hesitate to stop me during my presentation uh, as they come through. So. Um, this uh, image that you see, it's in in included in your packet, the area that's and dashed outlines is the subject property. Um, it's irregular in shape. It's about 80 acres. Um, the property does butt up against the Northwest Arterial to the north, West 32nd Street to the south. Um, there is a little appendage that goes down um, along Tiffany Court that extends all the way down to 32nd Street. Um, the property is primarily a mix of agricultural land that's been row cropped. And then we have some limestone bluff area and some um, cedar trees that indicate quite a bit of rock in certain areas of the property. Um, this is an exhibit that's included in your packet that's showing the areas to be rezoned. The areas that have been identified in red are proposed to be rezoned to R1 single family residential, and then the areas shaded in blue are proposed to be R4 multifamily residential. You'll notice a little break between the red there. There is a lot that is already currently zoned R1 single family residential and that will show up on the adjoining map here that, um, in a couple slides here. Um, what's been provided to the Zoning Advisory Commission um, and to the City Council here is a concept plan. Um, the developer is looking at um, redeveloping the property for a single family detached subdivision um, located at the top of the hill. Um, they are looking at not touching quite a few of the areas that are steep topography um, there is some rock outcroppings, like I mentioned, and to try to keep as much, many, as much of the tree cover um, that's available on the site um, and not touch and, and remove that portions of that. 
Um, so here you can see there is access that's coming off of Tiffany Court. Um, there is a second, another access that kind of shows go down 32nd Street. I'll describe and talk about that later in the presentation. Um, but there is a right in right out access that's proposed off the northwest arterial. We have two stub streets that are located to the north and to the south and to the adjoining property to the east. Um, when we look at development, we always encourage um, stub streets to go into the adjacent properties for future connectivity. Um, that allows for emergency access and proper flow and better flow throughout all of our city. Um, there are situations that we know we could have a lot of cul-de-sacs and dead-end streets. Um, that does not work very well. We look at how the adjoining properties can be developed in the future. Um, and these streets are typically public streets um, to pr help provide access um, through those properties. So this exhibit that's before you is the rezoning exhibit. Um, I probably should have chose a couple of different um, contrasting colors a little bit better, but the area outlined in red is the, the proposed subdivision, um, the area that's in question for rezoning. Uh, you'll notice that it is shaded in green. That property is, is currently zoned agricultural. But the adjoining properties to the west and to the south and to the east are all zoned R1 single family residential. Um, in regards to our comprehensive plan, the future land use map has identified this property to be single family um, residential. And um, I'm gonna step you through kind of the, the development process that we get involved when we look at uh, subdivisions that come before um, the Zoning Advisory Commission City Council. So um, when we look at a development like this, the first step is to apply for a rezoning. And we look at the rezoning, we're looking at changing of the land use. Are there appropriate uses that the property could be used for um, and are they compatible with the surrounding properties and are they in compliance with our comprehensive plan? To answer that question, the proposal rezoning to R1 single family definitely meets that comprehensive plan requirement. Um, we have a comprehensive plan that is encouraging mixed development, um, is encouraging infill development. This would be an infill um, site, as you can see with the surrounding developments around it. Um, but then in addition, you know, like I mentioned, mixed development, the R4, for multifamily, um, it's definitely an opportunity to be able to provide that down on West 32nd Street for the area. There are several aerial photos that I include in your packet just to kind of talk about how um, subdivisions are developed over time. So I'm gonna kind of take you a little step through history here. <laughs> just bear with me here a little bit. So we have the 1930s aerial. The area outlined in red is actually the property that's in question. Um, you can see that a majority of the surrounding property is all agricultural farmland. And as we step through time, um, we come to the 1960 or 1950s, uh, post-World War II, you start to see more and more residential development uh, located in the south um, east portion of the screen that you're looking there to the south. Um, as development is, uh, occurs, property is typically rezoned from agricultural land to a different zoning district, whether it's residential or industrial or commercial, um, based off a comprehensive plan and future land use map discussions. Uh, here's the 1960s aerial. You can see as the land continues to grow um, to the north, um, West 32nd Street used to be known as Millville uh, Avenue or back in the day when it was in the county. Um, and that was kind of a farm to access road that kind of took individuals from the north side of Dubuque down to the Central Avenue corridor. Um, here's the 1970s aerial photo. You can see more and more development to the south. And then also you start seeing some of the county subdivisions pop up along uh, John F. Kennedy Road. Um, there is a portion here. I don't know if you can see my cursor at all. Maybe, maybe not. Um, you start to see uh, Blazin and Brook Lane is a portion of the development to the, to the west. Um, that is the start of some potential accesses to the property in the future, which I will discuss in a little bit. 19 areas photo, you can start to see Arbor Oak subdivision developed. That's the site that's around Eisenhower Elementary School off of Spring Valley Drive with access off of Highland coming from West 32nd Street um, and other development as we continue to grow to the north. All zone agricultural land, but they've been repurposed um, for different zoning for development. 1994, you see Arbor Oaks is pretty much developed, but then also you see this roadway that pops up on the left-hand side of the screen, that's the Southwest Arterial. That was extended to John F. Kennedy Road. 
um, which then provide access into 32nd Street that goes all the way down to Central Avenue. Um, prior to the Northwest Arterial being completed all the way through the development down to 52, uh, 32nd Street carried approximately 7,000 vehicle trips a day. That's been greatly reduced with the opening of the West 32nd Street down to 3,800, 4,000, it kind of fluctuates. Um, as we move forward, you can see uh, Tiffany Court is starting to develop off to the left. And as I just continue to step through here, um, Arbor Estates is starting to pop up here in this next um, aerial photo off to the left. We're seeing that 32nd Street kind of bends around, it's connected to the JFK. Um, we're starting a development of another residential subdivision. And as we step forward, here's 2005, which um, you can see the Northwest Arterial was extended in 2002. Um, we got 2005 aerial photo. And as I just continue to step through, you can see more and more development being expanded and kind of working its way into this area to the point that we actually have kind of an infill area that's bound by the Northwest Arterial to the north, West 32nd Street to the south. Um, and then we have the Stub Street Tiffany Court that extends into the west. So when properties are annexed into our community, they come into the community as either zoned ag, and agricultural is the holding district for future rezoning or development of the property. Um, a lot of times we'll have annexations that'll come in with a request of rezoning and they're done concurrently. In this case, when this property was annexed in the city, um, they did not request a rezoning at the time, so that is why it's currently zoned ag. And actually the use of the property right now currently is ag as well. Kind of step through a little bit of the platting history of the development. So um, one of the big discussions with uh, the location and access to this subdivision is Tiffany Court. Um, so I'm just going to step you through a series of plats um, that shows how Tiffany Court was developed. So back in 1994, there was a final plat that was provided to the Zoning Advisory Commission and approved by the City Council. And there's a couple items I would like to point out on this, this map. So the first thing is that red line is the western edge of the property to be rezoned. Um, you can see that Tiffany Court is extended all the way to that property line. Um, like I mentioned here in the Stub Street, shown on your image here. But then we also have a temporary cul-de-sac easement that's provided at the end of that. Um, that is because when we have uh, Stub Streets that end, we need to have the ability for people to turn around and not have to use other people's driveways. Um, uh, and then also for opportunities for plow trucks, uh, garbage trucks to be able to turn and, and be located on those properties. But in this case, there was a temporary cul-de-sac easement in 94. Um, and then also, I'd like to point out that um, Brook Lane was actually extended here to make connectivity to Tiffany Court. Um, once again, we, we look at extending those stub streets to provide kind of an uh, in interior street network to, in order to help with traffic flow throughout our community. In 1997, uh, the upper portion of Tiffany Court is being developed. There's additional lots that are being provided. Once again, we still have the temporary cul-de-sac easement located at the end of that stub street. As we move forward, now that lot that was there was actually subdivided into two lots. We have a larger lot two of eight located behind the subject lots on uh, the northern side of Tiffany Court. But once again, we still have that temporary cul-de-sac easement located there. Um, those lots to the north were actually subdivided. Um, they were donated to the Arboretum and then through the city. Um, those lots were subdivided and then sold off to the adjoining property owners on Tiffany Court for extensions of their yards because directly to the north of this property around 2002 was the Northwest Arterial that was created. So it was kind of helped sever, sever those areas. Um, but we still, once again, have that temporary cul-de-sac easement. Eventually a house was built on that lot and then that temporary cul-de-sac uh, was extended onto the adjoining property. Um, it is a combination of milled, uh, millings and gravel um, in order to provide a temporary turnaround surface. But this is an, a pictometry aerial photo of the property in 2020, um, just showing the layout of the houses, the lot layout, and then how the stub street is extended all the way to the subject property. The photo that you're seeing here is looking east down Tiffany Court um, from the bend um, as you come up Tiffany Court. And then when we get to the end of that property, you'll see a fire hydrant where we extend water and sanitary sewer all the way directly to the uh, end of the street for future connectivity. 
But then, uh, as you can see, the street goes right to the property line and just kind of ends at that location. So why do we have stub streets? We actually have stub streets located all over our city. Um, these are a series of three maps. Um, the maps show uh, different areas where stub streets are currently located. Um, so if you see a red circle, those are stub streets that exist for future connectivity to the adjoining property. And the circles that are in green are actually stub streets that have been extended for future development um, for uh, other, you know, development for the subdivision in our community. So to get back to, to the proposed development, you know, as I mentioned, it is in compliance with the comprehensive plan for the future land use um, and the proposed use of single family residential development with the exception of the multifamily R4 located down on 32nd Street. Um, I would like to note that this is a conceptual development plan. So what's before you tonight is actually a rezoning of the property. Is it appropriate to rezone this ag land from you know, ag to R1 and R4? Um, a lot of times we'll get in discussions that may relate to access, which typically gets handled through a platting process. It'll be through a preliminary plat and through the final plat process, which we receive improvement plans. And when we receive those plans, it actually gets reviewed by our development review team for a code review. That'll go before the engineering department, the fire department, water, building, and planning departments to make sure that they're in compliance with what we call um, SUDAS, a statewide urban design and specifications. Don't quote me on that. Um, but in addition to our unified development code, which regulates bulk regulations from size of lots, setbacks, street widths, um, landscaping, you know, density, lot coverage, a lot of other things. And then also stormwater management is handled through that subdivision plat review and grading um, for the area. So um, what you're approving tonight is just the rezoning of the property. Um, this is, like I mentioned, this is a conceptual. Um, I don't like a lot of people that assume that if this gets approved, that's actually what's gonna get built because there are still additional review processes that will go through this. Um, a lot of discussion that stemmed from the meeting was regards to an access down to 32nd Street. Our unified development code requires two means of access for a subdivision um, when you have 40 or more lots. In this case, um, the right in, right, out, right in, right out access on to the Northwest Arterial and then the extension of the stub street of Tiffany Court will meet that requirement. Um, the engineering department has done extensive analysis of traffic and site distances um, located throughout the Tiffany Court, Blazin, and Brook Lane areas. Um, that access that goes down to 32nd Street is not required um, at this time um, because the Tiffany Court access and the right in right out access meets those requirements. But we also did an analysis of that. So the engineering department went out and looked at site distances from that location. Um, we looked at site distances from Tiffany Court and then Blazin. Uh, they did a detailed analysis, a traffic study to the point what were the speeds of the roadway that will go through there. And just looking at that intersection with that proposed road, which wouldn't be required, we had concerns about site visibility, site distance, um, the rate of speed, the vehicles are traveling on that location. And then not only that, but that is a pretty steep portion of property which would require that um, there'll be substantial grading. Um, most likely retaining walls would have to be installed for that location. And then we're looking at um, preliminarily anywhere from 14.5% to 15% grade of a street, which is extremely steep. Um, Tiffany Court is currently 12%. Anytime we get involved with new subdivisions, we'd like to keep them around 10% or less. There are situations where we may need to go greater than that. That's primarily for emergency secondary access only. Um, but as we look through this, um, and we look at access, um, the, the access to the development through Tiffany Court meets all the SUDAS requirements. It's actually uh, has great site visibility, look up and down 32nd Street. Um, but like I said, most of that will get involved with the platting process. So is there additional opportunity for public input? Definitely. Um, those preliminary plats go to the Zoning Advisory Commission. Um, they, uh, an individual may request uh, an opportunity to speak at the Zoning Advisory Commission, as well as when it comes to before you guys, we have the public input process for action items um, before your, for your council. I would like to note we do not publicly notify for um, action items like preliminary plats. They will not get an official notice from the city of Dubuque saying a preliminary plat is being submitted. Um, most of those are typically code review um, requirements. 
it's not an official public hearing like you would have in this case for rezoning. Um, so there is opportunities if people want to be notified, they could um, sign up for the city's notification process for anything that comes before the Zoning Advisory Commission. They would just get a notice about what's coming before the commission and that's an opportunity for that, um, for that area. Um, the other things that I'd like to talk about is we recently had a work session before you with regards to housing. Um, housing is a definite need in our community. Um, we are currently short about 600 units and um, when we look at that, we look at workforce housing in this case. There's some information that's been provided in your packet that kind of shows some, the type of housing, the sustainability. That's what's being proposed. Once again, it's not set in stone. Um, if this property were to go through a development review process may be required for um, incentives like TIF is typically what we're doing with residential subdivisions which would have a little bit more teeth um, to be able to provide some uh, binding requirements as part of the TIF funds that are associated with the, with the development for that. Um, I would also like to note there's some questions about is there any other subdivisions that would be very similar to this or you know, is there a potential for development to the east for the extension? And the answer is yes. You know, it's vacant, ag or vacant residential land to the, to the east. And, um, you know, we have some very long accesses and, and drive accesses that go through this area through streets. Um, Timmerhurst is a good example um, where we have two accesses, one on the North Cascade Road, the one comes off Manson Road, a very long linear street. Um, that street is 50 foot right away, 31 feet of pavement. That's kind of what's being proposed here. So in the future, like we mentioned with these stub streets, if they were to ever be extended and we would encourage connectivity, um, there would be potential for access to be extended to the other existing street network um, located to the east of this property. Um, that's all I have unless you have any questions for me at this time. Well, thank you very much. And before I open it to the public, uh, what the uh, council members to have the opportunity to ask questions or comments, I'd like to first of all talk, ask you about, you talked about the different steps and you started with rezoning as step mm -hmm. number one. Could you go through the other steps after number one? Yeah, so when we look at subdivision, the first step would be whether or not to get the property rezoned. And some people may ask, you know, why, can they just submit a preliminary plat ahead and get, start laying out the design before they get a rezoning? Well, uh, there is considerable cost for some of the engineering that gets involved with laying out streets, developments, and everything that's associated with that prior to knowing that they even get approval for the rezoning. So the first step um, is to go through and look at uh, getting that rezoning. Then they look at a preliminary plat. We actually have a pre-application meeting where the developer and the applicants have an opportunity to sit down with the city staff um, to discuss the layout, the design of the subdivision, um, what are the requirements, um, what would be, um, you know, lot sizes, the street layout connectivity, and we all ha we have that discussion. And then the engineer will come along and prepare a preliminary plat. We take that preliminary plat to our development review team that meets weekly. Um, they'll review and provide comments. Those comments are provided back to the developer for revision, and then we take that preliminary plat to the Zoning Advisory Commission. Uh, the Zoning Advisory Commission will review that plat and then um, make a recommendation to City Council. And then the City Council will have the ability to, um, you know, review and approve that preliminary plat. That's the first phase. Okay, so now we just have a preliminary plat, okay? It's not actually platted off. There's not actual lots that could be sold. Then we go to the, what we call the final plat stage. So that could be um, done in multiple phases typically. Um, they may look at doing, you know, I'm gonna do 20 lots at a time. Um, that's where they really get involved with the improvement plans. And a lot of times you won't see the improvement plans at this level, you're just gonna see the, the final plat. Those improvement plans are being reviewed by those five departments that I mentioned to ensure that they're in compliance with all city and state codes and the Unified Development Code. Um, before we even bring the final plat before you. So we're making sure that they're meeting the code requirements. And if they're not meeting the code requirements, it's very specifically stated as part of that final plat. A lot of times you'll see some plats that'll come before you that, that a lot may not have the required amount of street frontage. Um, there may be a recommendation to waive that requirement for street frontage and usually there's an ex explanation of why uh, we were, were asking for that to be uh, waived. But once we go through the final plat process, um, through the Zoning Advisory Commission, you know, like I mentioned, it was the DRT, they'll review that, we'll get the final plats approved, and then we'll take it to the Zoning Advisory, or actually, we, we will go directly to City Council, not the Zoning Advisory Commission, excuse me, 
um, with a resolution that identifies what portions of that development may be dedicated to the city for a public purpose. Um, that may be the streets, the stormwater, um, you know, several detention basins. There's a lot of things that could be dedicated to the city. But then at that time is when the, the subdivision plan is officially being approved. Um, in addition to that review, we actually, we actually receive inspection, um, construction fees um, for the city to go out and inspect to make sure it's following the requirements um, before the, the approval is, happens. We just want to make sure those are um, bonded so we have that covered in the event that this gets approved and it never starts, there's funding available to complete the subdivision. So um, as we go through that process, they go through and they'll do the um, approval. We give them an approved uh, final plat. They can go out and start work, but they have to obtain all the necessary permits through the city. There are several, I'm not gonna go through all of them. Um, then the city's doing the inspections and then there's a follow up to make sure that it's in compliance with, with the codes. Um, and the, the approved preliminary plat, or the approved final plat that was approved for the subdivision. Okay, great, so, so. we have rezoning is number one, that has to happen first. Then uh, number two, preliminary plat. Number three, development review. Number four, zoning advisory commission. Number five, final plat stage with code review. Number six, it goes to the city council. And then number seven, I have site inspections. That sums it up nicely. There, there it is, okay. Thank you, other, other members? Yeah, Wally, uh, Susan. Uh, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, yes, Mr. Uh, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I, I would like to make a suggestion. I think it would be best if we were to open for public comment first, and um, that helps us as a council avoid the uh, possibility of getting into discussion before we actually hear from the public in a, in a public hearing. Okay, is that standard? I would refer to the city attorney maybe for that question. So, so typically the safer way to do it is to open it up for public hearing first in the event that there's commentary from the council and that is saved until after the public hearing is closed. So that is standard. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, and so, and thank you for your comment. And uh, we're gonna stop for a second, but you'll absolutely be asked to come up and ask, get asked some more questions. So right. thank you very much for that. So I have, as I mentioned before, uh, we are in a public hearing to consider City Council adoption of this resolution. Uh, it is amending Title 16 of the Dubuque County, uh, the City of Dubuque Code ordinances uh, by reclassifying um, from uh, Agricultural District to R1 single family residential and R4 to and R4 multifamily. So uh, now is the time if you would like to do uh, some input. Uh, do we have some, Miss um, Breitfelder, do we have some, um, uh, so we have five minutes on this? Is that what we do? We have generally uh, asked for five minutes or less or? Yeah, generally five minutes. Open. Okay. Generally. Um, and then if you could please begin your input by saying your name and address, please. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, my name is Paul Baker and I live at 2945 Breck Road. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Baker. Go and ahead and I would like comments. to address the elephant in the room, and that is that the chairman of the zoning committee uh, is the developer of this, and, he, and, and the zoning committee approved an R4 change or a recommended R4 change. Uh, the, the planning committee supported that, uh, and everything else is surrounded by R1. And if that does not give the appearance of a conflict of interest, on the part of the zoning committee chair, even though he resigned or he, excuse me, he recused himself from voting, I, I don't know what would be, be a bigger example of an, of an appearance of a conflict of interest. The other thing that I would like to emphasize, and the, the planning director talked about the slope of Tiffany being at 12% and the recommended being 10%. In the zoning committee, he also emphasized that it was 31 feet wide and that was sufficient to support the additional uh, road traffic. Breck Road is 22 feet 7 inches in front of my property. It's 9 feet shorter. In the wintertime, the people that live on Tiffany come down Breck Road. These 100 homes are going to come down Breck Road. A 22 foot 7 inch roadway is not designed for that traffic. So as you are contemplating the approval of this, and you'll, you'll hear from me again as we go through this process, 
the solution is a connection to the northwest arterial because it will not have a 12% slope. It will not send two or 300 cars down a 22 foot roadway. And it's a win-win for everybody. But I do think that, the, that there's a significant appearance of a conflict of interest from the zoning committee as it has proposed the changes to you. And I think that should be addressed. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Baker. Anyone else? <coughs> Greetings, honorable mayor, council members. My name is Chad Cox. I live at 2742 Tiffany Court, a quiet court that I've lived on for 26 years. I'm here on behalf of myself, my neighbor, Eric Lucy, and many other residents of Tiffany Court, Blazen Drive, and Bruick Road each of whom have signed the petition that's contained in your materials asking that this zoning change not be approved before there's adequate arrangements in place for access to the planned subdivision. We, my group of neighbors, are nearly unanimous in not objecting to the, to the subdivision that's being proposed. We understand the city's need for growth, additional housing, and the additional tax base that comes with that but growth can impose burdens. And in this case, given the proposed limited access to the new subdivision, we believe the city would be dumping nearly all the traffic burden on us, that is the residents of Tiffany Court, Bruick, and Blazen. We believe that's unfair and we believe it's avoidable and that through reasonable action by this council, that unfairness can be avoided. As you know, under subdivision standards, just referred to by Mr. Warnemont, any subdivision with more than 40 lots requires at least two points of access. Here we have a proposed subdivision two and a half times that size, that is to say 105 homes, plus presumably, according to the concept, a dedicated park with hiking trails. The city staff's position to date has been that the only required access points would be through a connection to Tiffany Court and a right in, right out only on the arterial. We don't think that right in, right out on the arterial even meets the true spirit of a second required access point. Very few subdivision residents will use the arterial access, especially when leaving the subdivision. Given the future features of Dubuque, Nearly everyone headed out of the newly proposed subdivision, headed for work, shopping, school, or medical care, will choose to use the Tiffany Court access rather than the arterial. That will leave Tiffany the de facto entrance and exit for the new subdivision. With 105 homes, you're talking close to 200 vehicles. At a couple of trips per day, you're talking hundreds of vehicles per day up and down Tiffany Court, or up and down Tiffany, Bruick, and Blazen, and presumably more cars if the developer puts in the dedicated park and hiking trails that are contemplated in the conceptual plan. Our concerns are with traffic volume and safety. In addition to all the vehicles of the subdivision residents, we're also talking about emergency vehicles, school buses, and delivery vehicles. We need your help in getting a result that's fair to those of us who live on Tiffany, Bruick, and Blazen. We are requesting that the city defer any action on this rezoning request unless full access to the arterial and direct 32nd Street access is part of the deal. We recognize that you may not be in a position to assure that, and in that case, we humbly request that a full independent study of likely resulting traffic take place before the zoning request is approved. I keep hearing about how this has to follow, that, that's down the road, that's a different step. But we're, we're aware of other situations where zoning has been held up before, to, to, until such time as access issues have been resolved. In the letter that our group sent to you today, which you may not have seen yet, I have copies if you're interested, we set forth our reasoning as to why we feel a comprehensive traffic study is important and why it makes sense. We know that the 80 acres immediately east of this proposed subdivision is likely to be developed in the near future, as is the 40 acres that lies immediately north 
immediately across the arterial. Given these realities, we think a more comprehensive plan for future traffic needs to be assessed and implemented. That needs to be done by a responsible city. We think that a full intersection on the arterial, whether it be a roundabout or a signalized intersection, is going to make sense. You have the power. We are imploring you to find a solution that spreads the burden of development more equally amongst all Dubuqueers rather than dumping it on a small group of residents that live at Tiffany Court, Bruick, and Blasen. At the Zoning Advisory Board meeting, city staff made a point about how common it was to, to uh, extend stub streets and later extend them. Tiffany Court has always been named Tiffany Court since its construction in the early 90s. Everyone who purchased a home there expected it to remain a court. Our math informs us that Dubuque has 53 so-called substreets, 17 that are already connected and about 36 that are proposed. Only two stub streets are named court. One is Oak Park Court behind Oak Park Place, and you can't drive through it. It's an access that has, it's gated off. The other is Tiffany Court. We believe in making an entrance to this proposed new 105 home subdivision would make it the first court in Dubuque history that would have over 25 additional homes connected to it. I thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much, Mr. Cox. Is there anyone else who would like to speak to this? Yes, it's Keith Lucy, um, 3065 Huntington in our Oak Oaks area. I'm asking the council tonight, as he had mentioned here too, to, to finalize studies before we just move forward with ambiguously proposed things that are on a drawing to pay, pad here. Is there any reason, anyone in the council have any reason why we can't postpone this vote to, to change the zoning until after the appropriate studies have been completed and finalized? Susan Farber, do you have any reason Sir, why they can't we're be? not gonna ask individual oh, we can't. council just, okay. members. So as the council itself, as a whole, is there any reason why we can't? This is your opportunity to provide public input. They yep. can't respond to you at, oh, at yeah, this we're just time. Going to they listen. will discuss it later. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your input. Mr. Lucy. Thank you, Council, for hearing us. Uh, Larry Berquist, 2797 Tiffany Court. So I mow around the stop sign at the bottom of Tiffany that would turn onto 32nd Street and keep the, the fire plug shoveled in the wintertime. Um, I just ask, I, I've heard, you know, there are many steps here. Uh, there are large concerns from uh, the affected neighborhood about the traffic patterns and just that it doesn't seem like it's in the spirit of two access points, maybe one and a half. Um, so I would ask that rather than continuing to invest uh, time and, and money and, and stuff, let's settle this and, and have a high confidence solution going forward before there's more money invested and, and more, uh, I, I'll even say more feelings and, and emotion in, in this decision. So I, I think that would be, I, I'll just humbly request that uh, uh, before making a rezoning, uh, that we have a confident plan going forward for the safety of the community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Burden. Hi, Annalie Ward, 2758 Tiffany Court. I just want to echo what Chad said. Uh, he did it so well. <clears throat> I just wanted to add a little bit in our concern for the access points, one thing that we perhaps you don't recognize is that little connection to Brook is uh, it's a street that has no sidewalks and no curbs. And it's a street where we all walk and kids play. And the safety issues are large. 
The safety issues with the tight turn and a lot of traffic, we happen to be the corner house. And uh, as it is with the little bit of traffic, it's sometimes terrifying to back out of the driveway. I can't imagine with that much traffic. And then the concerns about safety of the grade on Tiffany Court in winter, if we have a couple of cars backed up, we start to slide. Now imagine if we have 100 cars trying to go there and there, all in this little, this little place. So please, uh, I echo these concerns. Let's find a way to solve the problem. We, we want housing, but we really want it done safely with full access points. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Ward. Hello, my name is Christian Peterson, 2745 Tiffany Court. And I know ever since I moved there, every time they dropped off the kids on 32nd Street instead of coming to the party area because trees, not a good roundabout there, turn around. And like I said, I drive a big truck and they need something off the arterial because they'll have everything from construction vehicles to home movers, anyone and everyone coming in there. And it's up and down our street. And like I said, Brook Road, you got low trees, you got tight corners, can't see. And just, I agree with everything Chad said. I'll second everything. It's just, just needs some, the study needs to be done first. And then have it done right, we'll be, we'll be happy. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Council, thanks for hearing. My name is Ray Herzog. I live at 2717 Tiffany. One point I just wanted to make, everybody says they don't want a light on the arterial. The arterial from Lowe's all the way to 52nd Street is five miles. Three miles of it has seven traffic lights on it. So a roundabout or another traffic light in the final two miles, I don't think is asking for a whole lot. So I want to make that point on top of what everybody else has said. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Herzog. Is there anyone else who would like to give public input on this issue? Very well. Uh, then thank you very much. Uh, and now, go back to the council for uh, some questions or comments. And uh, and Ms. Ms. Farber, did you uh, did you have something for us? Yes, thank you. And um, thank you very much to all of the residents of that area. Um, for coming here tonight and expressing your concerns about public safety, the safety for your children uh, as they're playing in the neighborhood, and then your very earnest desire to um, be supportive of housing uh, that we so desperately need within the city, but also your concern about the appropriate access, uh, one, if not two, as you had so mentioned, uh, to avoid the burden on your streets. Um, and I am very uh, impressed, um, if you will, by all of this outreach that you have done, all the research you have done, and all the time and energy that has been taken uh, to further research and to make the recommendation you have to the city council uh, tonight, and it's greatly appreciated. Um, I do have a question for Wally, if he is still available for comment. Hello, well, we're my planning services manager. Yeah, thank you, Wally. And so the the, um, the recommendation or the suggestion from the group of residents in that area is to actually postpone the zoning um, at this point in time to further discuss access. Uh, it appears that there might be um, a conversation to be held about the um, traffic studies, the distribution surveys, things like that, that they are talking about versus I think what may have happened or what has already transpired. Um, can we get some comment from you as to um, what your thoughts are based sure, on this input? Thank sure, you. so um, with regards to this, uh, we were contacted by neighbors way in advance of the previous rezoning requests with concerns with traffic. So um, the engineering department actually has gone above and beyond what we typically would do for rezoning. Like I mentioned, they have actually gone out and did site analysis studies, distances from the intersections that were concerns. Um, speed studies, traffic count studies, and uh, quite a bit of information as a result of that. 
um, to help address maybe some of those concerns that would be brought forward. And like I mentioned, a lot of times this gets brought up during the preliminary planning process. Um, we're, I want to ensure everyone that, you know, first off, you know, the pros, proposed project will increase traffic. No, no doubt about it. Um, to the area, especially along Tiffany Court, as it was mentioned. You know, Tiffany Court was originally platted to allow connectivity development to the east if the land was ever improved. Um, however, despite this, the residences along Tiffany Court have certainly become accustomed to enjoying limited traffic through their neighborhood on a stub street that effectively, you know, acted like a dead end street. Um, and like I mentioned, the traffic from 105 lot subdivision going through Tiffany Court will definitely increase. Um, there was a comment that was made about the accesses. Our code requires two accesses. Um, the proposed um, subdivision, which like I've indicated as we go through the platting process, would meet that if they use access from mm -hmm. Tiffany Court and West 32nd Street um, for the property. However, um, as we look at the development and people are living in the subdivision, to assume that all the traffic that will go through Tiffany Court, um, whether they're coming and going, um, would be kind of discussed in, you know, when we look at traffic studies, some of that is, you know, helped identify and there's assumptions being made. Um, when we look at the development, most of the people that will be returning to the development would either have to make a decision when they're in Northwest Arterial. Are they going to decide to turn at the light, go over, go down 32nd Street, come all the way around, come down 32nd Street, come up Tiffany Court to get to the subdivision, or are they just going to proceed straight forward and take the right in access into the development as they're coming from the west to the east? Um, so quite a, quite a bit of the return traffic most likely will come off the northwest arterial. Um, as they did mention, you know, as individuals that are leaving to the west, they would be leaving through Tiffany Court. Um, that is the only access point to the west um, uh, for that, unless people are proposing to go all the way down the northwest arterial and, and to the activities that they're involved with that. Um, I had conversations with the engineering department, you know, about whether additional traffic study should be required for the development. And they noted that it would not be necessary for 32nd Street, uh, Brook, Blas, and Tiffany, and even the Killarney offset discussions. Like I mentioned, they have gone through a thorough analysis of those areas for that determination. Um, however, they did say, you know, a, a small additional traffic study might be required as part of the, the lane improvements that would have to happen for a right in, right out access onto the subdivision. Um, I did ask the question, because it was brought up, you know, can there be a full interchange on the Northwest Arterial? It seems it would solve all the problems. Um, you know, when the, the engineering department looked at, you know, for the location of where a full interchange could be located on that site, and I want to remind you, when this came before, there was an article in the paper and we received a lot of phone calls from neighbors who don't live in the area that do not want a traffic signal or access or any additional blockage on the Northwest Arterial. But when we looked at the, that, we had that conversation, you know, there were concerns with potential site distance issues due to a vertical and horizontal curves where the northwest arterial comes through the property. Um, the intersection uh, would need to be flat when we look at roundabouts or uh, intersection, um, which um, makes starting, uh, stopping and starting semis, especially large trucks, difficult. Uh, this is a major arterial. It is a truck traffic area. Um, this kind of starting and stopping is damage to semi equipment. Um, the idea behind the arterial roadway is limited access, increasing capacity, flow, and safety. Uh, the planning process for the Northwest Arterial does not include a full intersection at this access point. Um, the city intends to continue this to protect the integrity, safety, and capacity of the four lane highway. Um, and that the Northwest Arterial's or original access was limited, um, but when the DOT purchased all access rights in this area except for several farm access points along the Northwest Arterial. Um, and that the uh, Mozina Farm access point was originally slated to be a right in, right out for the, um, for the extension of North Grand View through the site, if North Grand View was ever to be connected through the property. Um, that's not being proposed at this time. Um, so uh, there is a lot of concerns, a lot of discussion with regards to it. The only thing I tell you is currently right now, based on from a rezoning standpoint, it meets the comprehensive plan, it meets the requirements that are being provided through it. Um, when we go through the preliminary planning stage, um, we're going to ensure that whether it's follow the requirements for safety and access to the property. Um, currently, right now, based on the analysis that are provided, access at Tiffany and 32nd Street is the safest access point along that roadway, and the right in, right out access will provide that additional um, access through the site. We also have to look at how we're getting emergency vehicles there, fire and, and police, ambulance services. Um, and as being discussed the, with Tiffany Court being 30 feet, 
31 feet width of street and a 50 foot right of way and the proposed right in right access, that will definitely meet that requirement. And I mentioned we have subdivisions all over our community where we have two accesses with greater amounts of uh, single family home development um, that are currently meeting all those requirements before us. I don't know if that helped answer your question at all. Or it, it does, but the, the um, issue at hand, at least that which I'm understanding from the oh. residents, is the request for an additional study to look at a roundabout or speed bumps or another mm. access, um, because I understand when you hit JFK and you're zipping down to Central, you know, that's just, you know, a lot of people are very fast with their wheel management in cars. Mm -hmm. So um, is that not potentially an area that could be uh, examined and researched prior to us making a zoning decision so that um, those people that are here tonight, those taxpayers that are here tonight, mm. um, feel that there is um, opportunity for further communication and to problem solve together. Sure, so a traffic study um, is a considerable expense. Um, when we look at deciding whether or not a traffic study should be required, um, for instance, those take sometimes an amount of two months, mm -hmm. um, up to 10 to 15 to 20 thousand dollars they're associated. Um, that's a lot of money to be expended before you even know if you got your rezoning approved. Um, so normally what would happen through that development review process with the engineering department, they would uh, look at the analysis and make a determination whether or not a traffic study would be required. Um, through the, all the analysis that they've done at this time, they're stating that a future traffic study would not be required for the Brook Lawson and Tiffany Court lanes. You most certainly could table this request and require that a traffic study be conducted to further um, and analyze the area. I know when I spoke with the engineering department with regards to that, I don't know if there will be any additional information that would come out of it hasn't already resulted with the analysis that they've already done. Um, but that is certainly a possibility. And, and the reason that we're having this, this discussion is because I think that's really the point of contention here, at least that's what I'm discerning. Uh, and understanding, and um, I just think that in order to progress in this area, and don't forget that there may be some other potential um, developments on the eastern side, as you so noted, um, with some of the developers um, that have, you know, had conversation with some of us that, you know, maybe it's time to really, to, to, to do this study, uh, to um, open up the communication again, and to hear what um, is being expressed tonight by the residents of that community. Mr. Mayor. Uh, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, yes, Mr. Mayor. I think the point that Wally's trying to make is that the city staff sees no reason to require a traffic study. If the council decides they want to require a traffic study, the developer will have to decide if they want to do one to further the application. But the city staff sees no reason to do one. What's been proposed meets all of our requirements. The only thing that would be studied would be the length of a turn lane on the northwest arterial as part of the platting process. Okay. So, but if the council decides to do it, that's your decision, but it is not the recommendation of the city staff. Thank Mr. Mayor Tim, thank you very much. And I understand that and I really, I got that message also from what Wally was presenting. I'm just trying to uh, represent those that are here tonight and what their concerns are to alleviate that uh, and to just have a problem solving uh, that's further and better defined uh, for the community here and for the taxpayers. Thank you. All Thank right. you very much. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, yes. Oh, sorry. Oh, yes. I apologize for interrupting. Um, we don't have any uh, comments in the go to meeting chat, but we do have at least one caller on. And so I just want to pause and see if that caller meant to provide virtual public input to make sure they have that opportunity. Thank you. So, um, so if the person who is calling is concerned with this issue and would like to make a comment, please do. Yeah, not hearing anything. And again, there are no comments in the GoToMeeting chat. So I'll assume that that means that um, any callers in GoToMeeting are not meant to um, provide comment for this public hearing. Thank you. Thank you for the heads up, Ms. Roussel. Thank you. And Wally, your presentation answered a lot of the questions that I had and that I had heard, um, as Ms. Farber stated, from the neighbors in the Tiffany Court area. I watched the Zoning Commission meeting, um, and I have m many questions. And, and it, it does feel a little uncomfortable to go ahead and improve the zoning, <clears throat> knowing that I, have, I still have a lot of questions. Um, 
and you assure me that they'll be answered through the planning process and that residents would have an opportunity to provide input. Um, and I don't know if the developer would be willing to have another meeting with the residents to talk more about how this in-out um, access would work. But I think my biggest concern is the, um, the fact that the second entrance onto the Northwest Arterial, and I understand as you, why it would be the way it is as you explained it, um, but just right in and right out, um, it doesn't seem like a full second access. So for example, if Tiffany Court were blocked and, and the um, emergency people had to come, you know, there's only one direction that you can go. Um, but engineering is comfortable with those two access points? Do you want me to answer that question? Please. <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, we discussed that you know, with regards to the development. Um, emergency access to the development is the requirement for two accesses. We do have subdivisions that only have one access currently, and they're built before our current requirement of providing a second means of access to it. Um, the other thing to note is that you know, there are stub streets that are going to the west, so there will be future connectivity um, for additional access points to this development as it goes through um, time, I should say. You know, one, and, you know, one thing with this development is it's, it's been there for a long time, this chunk of land, and Tiffany Court was platted way back in 1994 um, with the roadway being extended there, um, but it has never been developed, and it was either not on the market or they were farming the property um, and being the connectivity for that. So. Um, some questions that may get brought up is like, when will the, those roads be extended for additional connectivity? Um, I don't know to answer that question. I know there are some comments that are made about um, a subdivision coming in. We haven't received anything at this time for future connectivity, but if there was, there would most certainly be that extension through that. But based on the right-in, right-out access and the Tiffany access, it does meet our requirements for the emergency access. It does meet our requirements for SUDAS. It does meet our requirements for Unified Development Code. Okay, thank you. Right. I may have some more questions. Okay. Let's go, Mr. Sprank. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for your time. Uh, Wally, a couple of questions, and maybe you can't answer them totally. The first one would be the conceptual plan where it shows the right in, right out. Mm -hmm. Can that be moved uphill closer to where that city park is proposed? Yeah, so that would be further analyzed as we go through the preliminary planning process. Okay. Um, and that's kind of a little bit of that traffic study that we talked about, like where the deceleration, acceleration, acceleration lanes would be located because we do have a curve of the roadway there. That's why it's not ideal for a full interchange for one, um, even along most of this area, and it is going up a hill. So um, if you think of our roundabout systems, they need to be flat and level. So you'd imagine an area where we're coming up to a roundabout and that transition point and we want the access and the flow of the truck traffic and the vehicles to go through this area um, as easy. But you know that would be further analyzed. This is where the farm access road was approved for right in, right out for North Grandview Avenue extension. So um, that's the current location that's being shown, but that would be further analyzed. Okay, and do we have an idea how much, a potent, what the cost would be to that right in, right out road access, what that would cost us? Do we have any idea, Gus? What, what a ballpark number, what that would be? Uh, I would not know. 10,000, 20,000? Um, I can't answer that question specifically, but I can a answer an additional question about costs. Um, the, th the, th the third access down to 32nd Street, we did do an analysis of how much that roadway would cost. Um, in order to put that access down to 32nd Street, it's going to be anywhere between 600,000 to 800,000 for that roadway to be put in. Um, which would be a redundant access. Like I said, it's not required. Um, as we look forward, we move forward with the development of these lots. We're trying to make workforce housing and kind of keep them in a certain targeted area. Um, with the extension of that roadway as another access that could add potentially eight to $10,000 additional cost um, to the development of those lots, which may make them a little bit, push them a little bit more out of affordability. But I'm not specifically what the dollar amount would be for that right in, right out off of the Northwest Arterial until we get further details on that. Okay. Ms. Wethel. Um, so thanks for all of the work that you and your staff have done because I, I cannot imagine the hours that you have spent on this project. And 
um, no matter what position you're on uh, in this decision-making process, I think we deserve to salute your staff for that. So thank you. Thank you. Um, is it common, and I apologize for not knowing this better, but is it common to rezone an R1 and an R4 simultaneously? Um, we do have sometimes where we get multiple zones that are rezoned at one time, but I wouldn't say it's quite common. It is. It isn't quite common. It is not. Okay. No. No. Okay. And then um, this is not meant to quiz you, so if you don't know the answer, I'm just curious as you were speaking. Um, you said the grade you thought of 32nd was probably 14.5 to 15% grade. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, the goal being less than 10%. I live just off of West 3rd. What's okay. the grade of West 3rd, West 5th? Um, no, sorry. So I mean, I, I'll, give, I'll give you an example. We actually have a list of all the grades of certain streets, like once they get over 14% or maybe 12%. So I'll give you an example of a road pitch that would kind of resemble the 14 to 15% here. So one would be um, Cox Street as you come off of Kirkwood. Um, there's three streets. Um, Main, uh, Main Street as it comes off Kaufman Avenue, there are certain portions of that roadway that is 14, 14 and a half. And there might be greater than 15% in certain areas. Um, and then there's one other chunk I can't think off the top of my head. But West 32nd Street or is definitely way over that. Actually, our highest um, grade, I believe, is 22 or 25 percent. Mont Crest is our steepest street in our community, if you've ever been there. Uh, Spruce Street is a close behind, but West 32nd Street is greater than that 14 or 15 percent. So it's even steeper than that. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, questions or comments? Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Um, first of all, let me just say that I'm, I'm very thankful to everyone who has um, spoken up about this particular issue. I, I appreciate all the emails. I appreciate all the um, information we received in this packet. And then, uh, obviously, appreciate people being there tonight to share their thoughts with us. Um, I'm finding myself as we go through this conversation um, kind of stuck on something that Wally said where uh, it, that is regarding what is before us tonight. What we're talking about is the rezoning. Um, you know, I think it, the, the list you made, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, and, and asked Wally about was, I think, really important to note that the process here is something that we go through as we go, uh, as we do anything well, with a project like this. And as part of that process, a lot of these questions that we're being, that we're asking tonight are going to be answered. Um, the, the question before us to vote on is a question of rezoning. And I guess my question is um, kind of more for the council, but um, I, maybe this is a question Wally can answer, but if we don't rezone this as residential, what else are we gonna zone it? Uh, you know, it's, it's in the, the plan to be, um, in the long range plan to, to be zoned as R1. And then obviously we've got this R4 added on. Um, but I can't imagine what else we would be looking at here aside from commercial property, um, potential industrial property, maybe office property. Um, but I, I don't think there's anything that says that we're going to keep it agricultural. I mean, it's in the middle of um, where things are expanding to. And we are going to see growth there. And I think that um, as far as the question of whether we should rezone it, it seems to me pretty obvious that this is what we would want to rezone it to and then work through the plans to make sure that they work with the neighbors. So um, I guess that's more of a comment. I don't know, Wally, if you have any comments to that, uh, if, I, if I did happen to throw a question in there. Right, I mean, what I can refer to is what is in our comprehensive plan and when we make decisions on rezoning in the future development, the comprehensive plan has identified it as R1 single family residential. Um, if we do look at a different type of use, and we have been approached, this property's been for sale for several years. We've had a lot of people approach us about a commercial development, which then you're talking about um, quite a bit of vehicle traffic that's uh, coming through the area. Um, you know, they have all want a full access at this location, and that's not going to be approved based on um, our analysis and the information that we're provided to it. So it's not really conducive for commercial development, for right-in, right-out access. Um, I would even say that from uh, institutional or industrial location. So what are we left over with the R1 or the residential development, which is what the future land use map has identified this property for. And with residential development, it's a low, low impact. 
Um, in this case, they're proposing single family detached homes with a multifamily development located off of 32nd Street, which would not take any access through the uh, Tiffany Court area. They would have separate access. Um, for instance, the multifamily would actually require a site plan that would go through the development review team. We would look at access points and analysis and everything for that. So currently right now, the land is ag and the future land use is identified as single family residential, um, which um, based on our comprehensive plan would be the best use at this location in my opinion. Thank you for that. I, and that's, that's kind of where I'm sitting with this. I think that, um, you know, the, the question that we're, that we're talking about tonight, I'm glad we're having the discussion we are. I think it's a discussion that needs to happen. Um, but it, it's also a lot of the points that we're making are discussion that need to happen at a, at a later point in this process. I really think that we should move forward with rezoning this as residential, um, as requested on the agenda tonight. I think it makes the most sense for the land use. I think it does um, fit with, with what we're looking at. So I do have one other question, though, um, and this, this is one, um, you know, uh, Mr. Baker brought this up uh, when he is the first uh, public comment tonight. Um, I want to make sure that we are clear on this, that, you know, this is obviously the, the proposal is coming from and the request is coming from the chair of our zoning commission, um, zoning advisory commission. So I do want to just be clear. Um, did Mr. Mulligan abstain from voting on this particular issue in the zoning advisory commission meeting? Uh, planning service manager Wally Wernemont, um, I will, can I elaborate on that question too to kind of provide some ex explanation? The answer is yes, Absolutely. yes, he has, he did abstain from the discussion. Um, I'd like to talk about conflicts of interest if you give me an opportunity to, because we do have that happen quite often with zoning board adjustment and zoning advisory commission. Just to kind of explain that a little bit. Is that okay, Mr. Absolutely. Mayor? Yeah. Okay. I'm totally fine with that. Thank <laughs> you, Wally. All right. So I understand we, you just heard a bunch of board and commission interviews tonight, right? Uh, volunteers are appointed to city or to city council board or to boards and commissions. In this case, the zoning advisory commission and zoning board adjustment and regulatory boards. They're defined and they have to follow state of Iowa requirements um, through our state code. Um, and in several situations, we have individuals that are located on boards and commissions that have backgrounds that are directly affiliated with development. Um, we have one individual that's on our zoning advisory commission that is an engineer. Um, we have an individual on our board that is a developer. We have an individual um, that's associated, that's, you know, that's retired a billion official. But anytime there's a conflict of issue, interest that comes up, um, a lot of times they'll recuse themselves and abstain from the, um, from the vote. Now, if they're the applicant, um, which happens in certain situations because they are individuals that are applying for certain individuals, uh, individual applications, um, they can come down and step, remove themselves. They're not a voting member. They can come to this podium and present their application. It would be much like if we had a zoning board of adjustment member who wanted to build a deck on their property and had to meet required setbacks. That board actually approves the waiver of those setbacks. Um, they have to be able for the opportunity to abstain and come down before you to be able to explain for that. So that was actually, you know, they did abstain. Um, actually, it's an, the individual in question isn't even counted in the vote. They remove themselves from the vote entirely, um, which what I want to mention is the vote was five to zero um, and uh, for recommendation for approval, and it just requires a simple majority vote. But yes, that did happen. Yes, there are situations where um, board and commission members have a direct a conflict um, that they recuse themselves or abstain. There are situations where those, where those boards of commission members are actually applicants and have to remove themselves and come down and actually present on behalf of their cases. Um, but they are not in the decision um, for the vote, so. I appreciate all that information, Wally. I think that's very helpful for all of us to hear. Um, based on everything I'm hearing tonight, I think that we should, or I, I would plan to move forward to uh, vote uh, in favor of the proposal before us. Um, because I do think it is the best use of this land and I think it fits. Uh, I think the, uh, the concerns that um, neighbors have raised are valid and we need to make sure that we are addressing those as we walk through this process. But I think for the question tonight, I would vote for this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, I have a couple of questions, if you don't mind first. And, and then this would be for Ms. Brumwell. So uh, the, the situation that uh, Mr. Wernermont talked about, the appearance of conflict of interest, and yet you're recusing, and that's all above board, and um, that's the process we use? 
That is correct. And um, we give all board and commission members an orientation, and they get a specific presentation about conflicts of interest, what that looks like, and the advice to call us if they have questions about whether they should or should not participate in an activity. Thank you. And I have recused myself from different things as well as other council members. Uh, another question for you. Um, do you recall, Mr. Cox mentioned that we have set aside um, a zoning questions before uh, to uh, be, because we want to resolve access issues. Do you recall a situation like that? I don't, but my memory is not great with all that goes through my head on a daily basis. That doesn't mean that that hasn't happened. I mean, it could happen. It could Correct. Happen. Um, does the does the word court have implications? Why would they call something Tiffany court if it weren't going to be a court, or is there not really implications with that word? No, there's not. Um, addresses are assigned by the uh, building official and working with 911 and fire and police to ensure that there's not confusion. We've periodically had to change them. Um, developers propose the names for streets, and oftentimes they're just accepted, as my understanding, as outlined on plats and things of that nature. Um, so they're not necessarily given by the city with any sort of I see. meaning. Okay, so it doesn't really have a necessary binding meaning, uh, meaning to it, and so this this Tiffany Court might even change names. Uh, if it's who, possible, it could. yes. Um, so, uh, Mr. Wernermont, so the right in and right out, uh, as other council members have expressed, just doesn't seem like a full access point. If I'm if I'm leaving, I'm really going to go down to John Deere. I have no reason to go down to John Deere, right? So, I mean, I, I suppose legally it counts. I, say, I agree with the mayor uh, in his, regarding the R1 zoning is the right, and I will agree, um, and I will vote for that tonight, but I think the council members have all expressed that our desire to uh, improve. You know, this is, as you say, a concept plan, and it's not approved, and there are minimums that have been required. Mm -hmm. And, and, and minimums, and they have been checked off. But I, I, I don't know that uh, it seems to me that uh, the minimums might not be enough for, for a plan like this, but we'll see. Um, so I intend to support this zoning request, but I, but I know there's a lot more in the process coming. Ms. Farber. Yes, thank you very much. I just wanted to, um, and thank you for your comments, and Mr. Mayor, thank you for yours as well. Um, and I do believe that what is at issue here is not that we don't support the zoning change. I think what is at issue here is the timing to have this vote for the zoning change and to give the opportunity to um, investigate and research the different points of access uh, per the request um, of the residents and per the conversation that we're having here tonight. So I will not be supporting the rezoning. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. Yes, Ms. Wethel. Um, I, I think one of my concerns, um, Mr. Baker had um, briefly touched on it. When I had made my frequent drives through these neighborhoods in recent weeks. Um, one thing that I kept not really understanding is the plan for, for the R4 multi-family dwelling. Um, I'm, I do believe that we are desperate for housing and we need to push forward efficiently but mindfully. Um, the addresses, of 1951 West 32nd, multifamily, 1901 West 32nd, multifamily, 1801 West 32nd. That just doesn't feel right to me and in the spirit of maybe what we don't know. And so there were renderings in the packet of the developer um, that were beautiful about the single family homes. And we will be so lucky to have such a beautiful development come to Dubuque without discussing the access. The development and the properties would be beautiful and accessible to many families based on cost. 
I didn't see any plan for the multifamily, and I understand they don't have to provide that at this point. I understand that's not necessary, but I, I would like to have more information on what the plan for the R4 would be. We focused a lot on access to the R1, and I share some of my colleagues' concerns, but I, I think I would like more information on R4, and one concern I had was could we vote separately on them? I, and I didn't know that that was an option for us to discuss and whether um, that would maybe help us to divide those two issues separately. So Wally, correct me if I'm wrong here, but I believe those can in fact be separated. Yep. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sprank. Uh, uh, It's frustrating. This issue, I mean, we, we all want to see this development happen on some level. Um, and to echo what Ms. Wethel said about, you know, it's access and everybody can agree with that. Um, I also look at this as whenever you take, whenever you're doing something big with land like this, a development, you want to be a good steward and an even greater or a better neighbor than what you have. And I, f and I really hope that the developer works more with the current neighbors so they all have an understanding and, come to some, and can come to some type of agreement that everybody's happy and content with. Um, and like I said, we all want to see this happen. And it's just, it's frustrating that we're arguing over ge uh, land and level. And it's like, okay, we, we've got streets that don't exactly work for this. So it's like, do we really care? Are we are that we are we are that are we that concerned with well the right in and right out location? Can't we just move it? So um, I mean I'm going to vote yes on going ahead with this, but I really hope the developer will be a better steward to and a great neighbor and work with his neighbors. So thank you. All right. Well, um, we have a motion and a second to receive and file and waive the three readings. In order for that to be successful, it would need to be a 6-0 vote. Am I correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. OK. So if that does not, uh, um, if that's not supported 6-0 tonight, uh, we could also go ahead with uh, first approval, correct? Reading, correct. First reading. And uh, they could also, and a member of the council might uh, separate those two uh, zoning requests between R1 and R4 if they so choose. Correct. Okay, if it does. So anyway, let's just go ahead then, please. Uh, we do have a motion and a second to receive and file and waive the three readings. Uh, so, um, Ms. Breitfelder, if you would uh, take the roll. Resnick? Aye. Frank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Roussel? Mm. No. Kavanaugh? Aye. Farber? No. That uh, fails four to two. Do we have any other motions? Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, yes, Mayor Kavanaugh. Um, one moment, please. I'm pulling up my screen here. I would move um, to receive and file and hold the first reading um, to um, approve both the R1 single family residential and the R4 multifamily residential rezoning. Thank you. Do we have a second? Okay, there is no second. So that motion dies without a second. Do we have any other motions? Mr. Yes, Mr. yes, Mr. Roussel. Is there, um, I know that the um, department didn't feel that a traffic study was um, was necessary, but from all the people that I talked to, this seems to be a very big, a very big issue. And I know we want workforce housing, but I know we want to do it, we want to do it right. 
Um, and is it possible that we could move to ask for that study, even though um, some people may feel it's not necessary, but it may be something that makes the entire um, process more comfortable for all of the people, not only the people that are going to live there, but the people that are already there and the people that live on the other side of, of um, West 32nd Street who get the overflow traffic when it's busy um, and they don't, people don't want to go up to West 32nd Street. Um, I've just heard from people all across that area uh, with concerns and um, I feel that a a study will allay a lot of fears and um, concerns. So, Ms. Bremwell, is that uh, is it possible to, to make a motion to approve first reading uh, with a traffic study? So, Wally, my understanding is that they could do first reading and put in their um, conditions. Yes, you could uh, do a conditional rezoning. And one of the conditions of approval of rezoning would be a traffic study. Um, that would require, um, we would have to have the developer agree to those conditions um, and sign off on that they're okay with accepting the opportunity for a traffic study if that's a requirement that you'd want to have placed as a conditional approval of the rezoning. Okay, thank you. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Is yes. it possible to do this in collaboration with some of the stakeholders here from the residents of Tiffany Court and Brook to be at least give input um, as to the kind of study they would be um, suggesting that we have heard, you know, just to... So when we... Um I might have to have the engineering department explain some of this a little bit, but to us, but when they look at a traffic study, they look at what intersections, what locations would be required to be included in that study. Um, I know we did receive some correspondence about looking at the intersections of Tiffany Court, Blazin, um, and then West 32nd Street's access where it meets uh, North Ken or North, um, John F. Kennedy Road, mm -hmm. some of those, those things. Typically with a traffic study, we have the, the developer would sit down with the engineering department. They would discuss the limits of that traffic study and what information that would be required of that. Um, that's all kind of hashed out ahead of time before they start the traffic study and go through that um, for that, so. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, Ms. Bethel. Um, I would like to consider separating out the R1 and R4 um, for separate evaluation. So you could make a motion specific to each I, I, section. And, and I know no one else mentioned that, but if, if any of my colleagues have comment or concern on that, I'd be interested to know your thoughts. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, this is Mayor Kavanaugh. Yes, Mr. Uh, Mr. Kavanaugh. Uh, so um, I'm sorry to interrupt. I know that um, Ms. Wethel has the floor right now, but I, I think from a point of order standpoint, don't we need a motion on the table to be able to have discussion? Um, and, uh, I'll leave that to the city attorney. There, there really should be a motion on the floor before it's discussed. Yes, so we don't have any motion on the floor. So um, unless we have a, a motion, we need to, uh, to go on, to move on. So I, is, is there a motion? I would like to make a motion to separately evaluate the R1 and R4 residential properties requested. I'll second is, that. So um, I, I would just make your motion specific to the one that you want to make a motion on. So whether it's the R1 R, or the R4, I would just make your motion specific to which you want to consider at this moment. I would like to make a motion to separately consider the R1 part of the property for discussion. So like, like a first reading? A first reading, okay. I'm sorry. Okay. So you, you would approve the first reading? Yes, please. Okay, so if we could help with so, that. So it, it, with the traffic study. Well, I, I have to let her make her, her motion. <laughs> Thank um, you. <laughs> it, it would be a motion to um, receive and file and do first reading for the R1 portion of the application. Okay, I would like to make a motion to receive and file for the first read of the R1 
requested rezoning. All right, do we have a second? Will that include the traffic study? I would like to be able to have a conversation about that. I think that that would be my reason to further um, the discussion on it. I'm, I, I think so I'd there, like- So we're looking to get a, a motion before we continue discussion. So d is there a second for the uh, motion that was put forward? I will second, Mr. Mayor Potem. All right, thank you very much. So we do have a motion and a second to approve um, R1 zoning uh, change for the first reading. Now, can we have some discussion on that? Mr. Mayor Potem, this is Mayor Kavanaugh. Yes, Mayor Kavanaugh. So um, I'm, I'm concerned with uh, the, the direction of this discussion, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say why. Um, you know, I hear agreement among us as a council that we need housing. We, this is a, this is a, a cornfield that has been sitting um, as a cornfield for decades now around other residential properties. We have a number of spots like that throughout the city. And my concern with the direction of where we're taking this discussion right now is we're making the, the even the beginning process of rezoning land to even move forward with the possibility of discussing replatting and access points and things like that in a plan. We're making that really difficult for developers. Um, I, I do not want to put us in a position as a city that we will be um, looked at by people who might be interested in doing this because this is the first time we've had interest in this area in this way, um, that they're gonna look at us and say, wow, Dubuque is too hard to work with. Um, you know, this is it's too difficult to get these things rezoned, so let's not even start the process. I just wanna point that out because it does concern me. I mean, we need housing so badly that we need to make the process work. Um, and I think that the way that we had this set up before with the discussion we were having, it was clear to me that city staff was gonna continue to work and I think even on this motion, city staff will continue to work with the, the neighbors to make sure that this is going to be done in a way that will, will work and be safe and, and be effective. So um, those are the comments that I have on this. Um, you know, I would be willing to vote for this particular motion uh, because I do think it moves us in the right direction. But I, I just want to point that out because I think we need to be careful about how we, um, how we go about this. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments, Ms. Wethel? I do think that there is a time and a place to further discuss and evaluate the traffic studies and the concerns of all involved. And I appreciate the hours of input and contact everyone has had. I am in agreement with Mayor Kavanaugh that I do not want to put roadblocks on opportunities of people who want to develop land that has sat vacant. And if we're serious about trying to create 600 units of housing. I seriously am concerned that this would create roadblocks. I am in favor of moving forward with R1, and I have faith that the process will indeed create discussion that is healthy with good intention about finding solutions. Um, I would plan to ensure that. Uh, but I do feel that we need to move forward with supporting the R1 designation for the rezoning. Do we have any other comments before we take a vote? Mr. Mr. Russell. Um, I really appreciate the feedback from my colleagues. Um, I liked what I heard from um, Mr. Mayor and um, Ms. Wethel, I like your approach of having just the first reading because it does give us more time for that robust discussion that needs to happen with all of the great input that we've had from the residents. And I think um, the first, having just the first reading is a good start. I would plan to support that. All right, thank you. Mr. Sprank. Um, if I'm not mistaken correctly, the last time that we had uh, development, we did do the three re readings. And I think it was for the, the um, that new subdivision that's being built. I think we did three readings for that. So I would have no problem with doing the three readings. So. 
All right. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Yes, Ms. So, um, I also um, am hoping that if we agree to the first, that we do include a study uh, going forward and we can also make that happen. Uh, and Karen, I would just defer to you as to how that could occur, perhaps if we move it forward, what our next steps would be in order to ensure that. So if you vote on the motion as is tonight, it would, it would reappear just for second reading um, on the same motion at, at a future meeting. So it would follow the ultimate path of second reading, third reading, and then the process that Wally has outlined if it gets final approval after three readings. So um, that's, that's not to say that there couldn't be some sort of a motion or addendum at a later point um, to determine whether there's consensus for, you know, um, adding. Okay, adding so things. we're just... Um and not that I'm not supportive of more housing for the city of Dubuque, I'm just still concerned about the residents and their need to um, work with Wally to have this um, uh, study. Um, and so I'm just concerned as to what the Robert's Rules of Orders are here in order to, to uh, propose that. Well, so there's a motion on the, on the floor, so there would be a vote on that, and depending on the outcome, for example, if it didn't go, if it, if it failed, you would have an opportunity to then put another motion forward. Okay. And is this 6-0 in order to proceed? No, this would, uh, be, being that it's first reading, it just needs a majority vote. Majority. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Mayor? Yes, Mr. Van Milligan. Thank you. Uh, City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Um, two things. One, earlier, Council Member Sprank asked the estimated cost of the turn lane on the uh, Northwest Arterial and Engineering estimates that at about $150,000. Um, but I do have a question about procedure. Couldn't a motion be made to amend the motion that was made? And the amendment would be to add that there's a traffic study required. And the reason I asked that question, I think staff has already made it clear that if we're not directed to require a traffic study, and then, of course, the developer would have to agree to that condition. We're not going to require one because we don't think one is necessary. So if you leave tonight without a vote that requires a traffic study and agreement from the developer that the traffic study, he'll agree to do one, we're not going to require one, except related to the turn lanes for the Northwest Arterial. So just to clarify, there's there's two ways that that could happen. There could either be agreement by the original um, movement and the seconder to adjust the language to, to require that, or there could be a motion to amend. So if you wanted to amend it to add that, you could make that motion. There would have to be a second, um, and then there would be a separate vote on that, and then we would revert back to the original as amended. And you could amend it on second reading, too. When we do second reading, you could amend that, or would it start over? I'm thinking. Because the state code requires an ordinance either that you either waive the three readings or that you do them individually. I think if you wanted to amend it on the second, it would require that we start over and we do three full readings to comply with the state code. Thank you. So the process is we have a motion on the table. And um, so if there was going to be an amendment, that would come before we... Now. Yeah, so... Do we have any um, anyone to propose an amendment? Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, uh, I'd, yes. I'd, I'd like to. Ms. Roussel. I'd like to amend the motion to include a traffic study. Do we have a second? Second by Farber. Okay. Now, do we vote on the amendment first? You can discuss it first if you would like, or you could just move to vote. All right. Any discussion on that? All right, we're ready to take a vote on the amendment. So, Ms. Breitfelder, if you would. Resnick? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Nay. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? No. Farber? Aye. That uh, amendment passes four to zero. 
Pardon me, four to two. So uh, now we have the uh, the Wethel. Uh, this motion now is first reading for R1, and it has a conditional approval. Is that how you put that with? Uh, I, I would just say as amended to, in, to as include amended a traffic to study. A traffic study. And then Wally, do you want? Did you want to chime in there? Yeah, I mean, you'd have to make a, the motion to include the condition that a traffic study be done. Um, but we would take that ordinance, we would draft it, and then they'll have to, we'd have to speak with the developer and they'd have to agree the, to the conditions because we're changing it from a straight rezoning to a conditional rezoning by placing that condition. So, Ms. Wethel, would you want to uh, offer that motion? At, at this point, so it would be her original motion as amended to to simply add the traffic study. All right, um, Mr. Cavanaugh, do you um, second that? Um, I, no, I don't believe that there's a change. It's, that's it's it's not required. Not it, required. All right, it's thank not you, Mr. Cavanaugh. Required because the amendment passed, so the amendment was to the um, prior motion. So the okay. vote would just be on that motion as amended. All right, so we are ready for a, a vote. Is that what you're saying, Ms. Bromwell? Yes, sir. All right, Ms. Breitfelder, if you would. Resnick? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Nay. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? No. Farber? Aye. That uh, passes four to two. First reading. All right, well, thank you, everybody. Just Spirited a discussion. Point yes. of order here. There's also the application for the R4. Did you want to, uh, did anybody want to make a, a motion regarding the R4? Mr. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Krenna, could you give us guidance on the procedure here? I, I don't know that I can because I don't know what you want to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, if there is no uh, motion in a second, what happens to that portion that has been um, pointed out as they wanted an R4 for that? Does it remain ag? I don't know if that is, is that ag currently. I'm sorry. It would remain ag because the no zoning approval has been made on it. So. Currently, right now, as you made a motion to, is to approve the single family with a condition of a traffic study, um, if the R4 zoning is not acted upon, it remains as ag. I guess it's a better way to clarify it. All right, so do we have a, a motion to uh, make that portion of ag uh, land into R4? I do not see any motion. Uh, yes, Ms. Purcell? So in order to have discussion, we need to have a motion on the floor, correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. All right. So I'm, I, I move to receive and file and move that a uh, requirement that a pro proposed ordinance be considered and voted on for passage at two council meetings prior to the meeting at which it is to be finally passed be suspended. Second by Farber. All right. So, so here's uh, my question for you, Wally. Um, these are for, isn't just slightly down the road, um, there are some apartment complexes already. Um, like on the other side, there's going to be a new one, is that correct? Yeah, correct, there is R4 zoning along West 32nd Street that's intermingled with single family development. Most of the R4 zoning is located on the south side of 32nd Street as you get towards Wildwood, um, towards the intersection with Grandview, um, North Grandview, um, and then there is a rezoning for what some people refer to as the garden plot <laughs> at the corner of uh, what would be the south west corner of Grandview and 32nd Street. All right. Any other questions? So um, you made a motion. Your motion is to uh, proceed on that. Okay, so your motion is to uh, receive and file and waive the three readings uh, regarding the uh, R4 zoning. Did I say that correctly? Okay. That's correct. And can I ask Wally one other question? 
Well, is it common that R4 is mingled um, with R1? Yeah, sure. So in an R4 district, there's uh, multiple combinations. Um, our zoning ordinance currently is called the Euclidean zoning. It builds off of the existing lower zone. So in, in this situation, what I mean by that is R1 allows single family, R2 allows single family and duplex, R3 allows single family, duplex, and sixplexes. And in an R4 district, it allows single family, duplexes, sixplexes, all the way up to a 12plex, whether that's at an apartment building or a row house. So with approval of an R4, technically single family homes could be built on that site. So. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so my question would be if this is approved uh, to waive the three readings and yet we have uh, one that has first reading only, um, so is there any problem with that? No, not if you're handling them separately. It's just that if the waiver mo motion passes, there would need to be the follow-up um, okay. motion, which is final consideration and passage of the ordinance. Right. So is there anybody else who would like to discuss anything about this? Uh, yes, Ms. Wethel. Wally, would you mind repeating for me one more time? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Sure. The R1, R2, R3, and how many um, uh, units can be built on that? Sure. In, a, in an R4 district, I'll just start to the top, that would allow anything from a single family home to a duplex up to a 12plex. Um, for apartment buildings, you need to have a minimum of 2,000 square feet per dwelling unit. Um, so if you have a 12-unit apartment building, you'd have to have 24,000 square feet of lot area for that development. Um, the R4 district is, I believe, a little over between three and four acres. Uh, it's being shown down there. So uh, a plat would have to come through if they wanted to subdivide that to create additional uh, apartment buildings at that location. Like I, I noted, the concept plan basically shows row houses, it appears. I can't verify that 100%. But, um, but in an R4 district, it does allow a single family home to be built or a duplex or up to, up to a 12 plex. So there is a variety there. Um, and it's really left up to the developer. And, and usually it's confined to how big the lot is and lot coverage, lot area. And I'm sorry, you said R1 would include duplex? Um, R4 is what it's being rezoned. Right, correct. And R4 allows single family duplex and up to 12 units. And yep. R1? R1 only allows single family. Okay. Detached. Um, R2 would allow single family and duplexes or a townhome, which is uh, laterally attached to single family homes. And an R3 would allow a single family, a duplex, or up to a sixplex, whether that's an apartment building or a townhome. And then R4 will allow all those things all the way up to a 12 plex. Okay, any more questions? One question I would ask. Um, if the spirit of developing um, the multiplex, uh, multifamily um, R4, um, I understand that this is to create a future um, development and that we don't have to have a design finalized today when we vote on that. However, I don't know that I would be comfortable with a 12-plex on each of those sites. Um, and so I, I would um, have concern with that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, then we are going to go and um, take the roll, if you would. So uh, we do have a, this is a, a motion to receive and file and waive the three readings for the uh, R4 section of this land. Ms. Breitfelder. Resnick. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Wethel. Nay. Roussel. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Barber. Aye. Uh, that uh, motion fails, five to one. Do we have anyone to uh, propose uh, first reading? Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, is it? Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, yes, Mr. Mayor. 
I move for first reading to rezone the area in question. All right, thank you. Do we have a second? Second by Farber. All right, so now we have a, a motion and a second. Any additional discussion? All right, Ms. Breitfelder, please call the roll. Resnick? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Barber? Aye. That, uh, that passes six to zero. Thank you all very much. And I think we're ready to go on uh, to our second public hearing. Public hearing number two is petition to vacate and dispose of city interest in the 20 foot wide alley south of Walker Street and east of Oneida Avenue in North Dubuque subdivision in the city of Dubuque, Iowa. Uh, right. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Yes, Mr. Sprank. I motion to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second by Roussel. Second by Roussel. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Van Milligan. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. City Engineer Gus Hoyas is recommending City Council adopt a resolution vacating and disposal of the right-of-way property described as Lot 599A of North Dubuque in the City of Dubuque to the Bible Baptist Church. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request Mayor and City Council approval. Uh, thank you very much. We are in a public hearing to consider City Council adoption of a resolution disposing of interest in Lot 599A of North Dubuque in the City of Dubuque. Is there anyone who uh, would like in the chambers to address the Council on this item? Is there anyone virtually? We do not have any virtual input. All right, thank you. I'll bring it back to the table for questions or comments. Seeing none, uh, we're ready to take the roll, Ms. Breifelder. Resnick? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Barber? Aye. That uh, passes six to zero. Uh, public hearing number three. Public hearing number three is Jewel Consolidated Funding Application Public Hearing. Mr. Mayor Potem? Yes, Ms. Farber. I move that we receive and file and adopt the resolution. Second. All right, so uh, we have a motion by Farber, second by Roussel. Mr. Van Milligan. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Director of Transportation Services Ryan Nucky is recommending City Council approve the consolidated funding application from the Iowa Department of Transportation as submitted. I concur with the recommendation and respectfully request Mayor and City Council approval. Thank you. We are in a public hearing to consider City Council adoption of a resolution uh, which approves the consolidated funding application uh, to the Iowa DOT. Uh, do we have anyone in the uh, public who would like to uh, speak to this? Any virtual? No virtual input. Okay. Any uh, input, comments, or questions from the Council? Seeing none, uh, if you would call the roll, Ms. Breitfelder. Resnick? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Barber? Aye. That motion passes six to zero. We will move on to public input. At this time, anyone participating in the meeting may address the City Council on the action items on the agenda or on matters under the control of the City Council. For all in-person attendees, please approach the podium and state your name and address. For all remote attendees, please enter your name and address in the chat function or state your name and address over the phone when the Mayor Pro Tem asks if there is any virtual input. If more than one participant would like to speak, then city staff will determine the speaking order of the participants. Individual remarks are limited to five minutes and the overall public input period is limited to 30 minutes. Under the Iowa Open Meetings Law, the City Council can take no formal action on comments given during public input or that do not relate to the action items on the agenda. And thank you. So do we have anyone in the chambers to give public input? If you could uh, give your name and address and then your comments. John Pregler, 15. 25 Pago Court, Dubuque. Mr. Mayor, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, ladies and gentlemen of the Council, and Mr. Van Milligan and city staff. I'm here to speak on action item uh, number three related to the Five Flags referendum. I'm here to request Mr. Van Milligan to provide his professional opinion on the referendum and the dollar amount sure to pass here tonight and likely to fail at the polls at the proposed amount currently. 
Dubuque's form of government is a council city manager form of government. The council is our city's board of directors. The mayor is our chairman of the board. And Mike Van Milligan is our city's president and CEO. Uh, collectively, the board or the city council, the mayor as chair, and the city manager as president are responsible for entering into and managing our city's current quarter billion dollar debt. It would be negligent to add another $100 million to that quarter billion dollar debt without speaking to or getting the professional input of our president and CEO responsible for coordinating the bonding agreements and paying them back if the referendum passes. Ms. Farber sits on the Finley Hospital Board of Directors. Would Finley's board ever consider a major reconstruction at Finley, shutting down a portion of operations, and taking on considerable debt without asking the opinion of Mr. Wol Wolbers, the president and CEO of Finley? Of course not. Citizen and consuls need to know if their city manager thinks it's a good idea to take on an additional $7.7 .7 million in annual loan payments for the next 15 years in addition to the twenty-five or $250,000 to $1 million in annual operating subsidies that would be required for five flags if we move ahead with the referendum and it passes. And what is the risk of... Uh, uh, this passing and another COVID style event, another great recession or a derecho or an unfunded billion dollar flood event like Cedar Rapids had in 2008. And where would Dubuque be uh, and how resilient would we be to be able to handle those types of events if we add this $8 million in additional annual expense uh, uh, to the uh, uh, taxpayers' obligations? So Mr. Mayor, I ask the city manager to weigh in on the topic here tonight and for the city council to vote on a bonding amount not to exceed $40 million to give this referendum a chance at the polls. So thank you uh, for your time here tonight and your service. Thank you, Mr. Pregler. Uh, is there anyone else in the chambers to address the council? Is there any virtual? We do not have any virtual input. All right, thank you very much. Uh, let's go on then. Act, we'll move on to action items. Action item number one is report on preparations for critical incident response to Dubuque schools. All right. Good evening, uh, Mayor, um, Mayor Pro Tem and Council. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Jeremy second. Jensen, Chief of Police. Uh, just a minute, I'm sorry. sorry. We need a motion, motion. and a second oh, yeah. before. Sorry, I got ahead of That's all right. I love the enthusiasm. <laughs> Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Yes, uh, Mr. Sell. I move to receive and file and listen to the presentation. All second right. by Farber. And second by Farber. Now we are all set. If you would please, thank you. Okay. I won't redo the introduction, so we'll start right right at the beginning here. It's. Right. I wish I didn't have to stand here and talk to you about this. Uh, it's one of those events. There's no silver lining in any of this. There's nothing good that comes out of this. Uh, but in, in lieu of recent events that happened, Uvalde, Texas, the question that comes up, what is the response? What does it look like for our community? Well, I, I'm going to talk about, sp particularly about schools tonight, but understand that, you know, look at this past weekend. This can happen anywhere. It happen at churches. It can happen at, at festivals. It can happen at uh, uh, just events where people get together, parties, et cetera. But I will focus on the schools tonight, and this is... Uh, uh, my daily prayer is that this does not happen here, <laughs> that we never ever after encounter this. But to give you a little background, so on April 20th, 1999, the school shooting happened at Columbine High School in Colorado. The police response at that time, and this is what it was, is this is a hostage situation. We set up a perimeter, the police uh, then call in a tactical unit, and we go and address and negotiate or address the uh, perpetrator or perpetrators in that event. Uh, found out that that wasn't good. People, people died, because, and, and partially because of the response and, and things that happened there. Uh, what I saw that came out of this is there was a 60 Minutes piece that was done at the time, and a mother of one of the, the young ladies that died in that event, uh, she talked about the police response and talked about police being wearing vests, having guns, et cetera, but then she looked right at the camera and said, do your job. So for us in the Butte Police Department, we took that very seriously. That, that hits home. So we started looking at the training. What first came out, active shooter training. We started doing that. Now, I said active shooter. 
So we trained to active shooters. And we started going very formalized type training, setting up with, re with the response team and the re rescue teams. When we did that, we found that time is of the essence. That still takes time. You know, there was a study that was done years ago that talked about how fast these things happen. Columbine was done in less than 20 minutes. You know, all these take less time, so that every second counts. So we, we developed in our next point, which is rapid deployment training. So rapid deployment is the emergency response of law enforcement to an active incident where suspect or suspects are engaging in deadly behavior and the location contains multiple victims. So like I said, our first iteration of this was response, the very formalized response in how we do things. Again, maintaining some control, maintaining uh, uh, how we respond to that. But again, because they weren't done, or they were, they were done so quickly, we had to change again. And also, the perpetrators in this changed. We started seeing perpetrators, they started locking doors. Uh, they going in, they started wearing body armor. Uh, we saw even in Columbine, we saw imp improvised explosive devices, things that slow the police response down. And then we added things like, that were things that have been added in the, in the last few years is elementary schools. That was not something that happened. Um, remember, officers are people too. This slows you down, you start seeing little kids on these things. So we developed a, a process and, and when do we use our rapid deployment training, or as we call active, aggressive, tr active aggressor training now. It's when a deadly assault may or may not be going on. The first iterations did not have this where we actually responded if it was not going on. We used to say if they're not shooting, we're winning, which is somewhat true, but there's other things that can happen in that. Uh, the second part of that, when a delay in law enforcement response could result in continued loss of life, you know, we don't want to delay anything. The third part of that is when a delayed recovery of victims will result in death. So those three things changed our response. Essentially, we're coming. We go. We're going to be there. The first officer on scene takes the information that is given to them and goes in. And then we start filling in. Now, and I'll talk about partnerships in a minute, but let's talk about the chaos. So this is where some of this is coming in. This is chaos. Pure chaos when this is going on. The 911 calls are going to be inaccurate, incomplete. Um, we may have multiple issues, we may not. Uh, we saw in Chattanooga over the weekend cars fleeing, running over people. Is that the suspect or is that just people trying to get out of the way? We don't know this information. This is the information we're trying to, to figure out. Um, armed off duty officers, armed citizens, other people with weapons showing up. We have to differentiate who's who on this at, during this chaos. Um, the 911 system will be flooded. Okay, we have contingencies. Our 911 here locally will be, and it'll roll over to the state system. But it is going to be flooded, with the, again this data coming in, a lot of data that they're trying to get out. A lot. Of, we're going to have a massive re law enforcement response from everywhere. We train with the, the area law enforcement in this. Everybody trains the same way when it comes to this. But there's going to be a, a massive. So radio is going to be be overloaded to a degree. Cell towers, cell towers will be flooded. Plain and simple. You probably won't be able to use your cell phone. Uh, one thing they saw in, in several of these incidents were parents responding to the school, which rightfully so. Parents are scared. Parents want to be there. But what happened is cars get <laughs> left in the middle of the streets and block, and, and emergency responders can't get there. Couldn't get ambulances. Columbine was a big one because of the street structure. They couldn't get ambulances up the street because cars were just blocking. So there's things that we have to contend with. Again, people fleeing, not only in vehicles, but on foot. You know, you think about, particularly if, if something happens in one of our high schools or middle schools, pretty mobile bunch of people. They're going to be gone, you know, and, and so they've got people fleeing there. Um, the injured, the injured, we're going to have to deal with that as, as we come across it. And then crime scenes. And as we're seeing this kind of trend, like nationally, is multiple crime scenes, because it seems like always something happens to a family member before they show up and do a mass, something else happens there. So there's multiple crime scenes. And then the social media aspect. Um, we will not be able to keep up with accurate information. You know? and, and so information is going to come out, and, and this is going to be the information we chase, but we're not going to have time to chase a lot of that information. So we're going to have to deal with that, though, at some point in time, a lot of that. Now, as I talked about our evolution, and, and we're going to talk about our partners uh, within the law, uh, first responder world. So 911 is a major partner here. So they got to take the calls. Uh, 
other law enforcement, and again, I talked about the area. Everybody in the area trains the same, same way. The Asbury Sheriff's Office, State Patrol, the DNR, they come to our training. We train together. All our new officers train together when it comes to this. Uh, the fire department, huge, huge. Because what we saw, we talked about this thing of with people or with the injured and not getting medical aid. So the first iterations with police officers. This is not, a fire role is not to go into a shooter in situations. They don't do that as a, as a normal, <laughs> normal thing. They took it upon themselves. They are the experts in injuries. We are not. So we asked them to come in. They come in and they can set up and do triage and, and transport, and we don't have to worry about that. And they took that on. So they, we can do that as the event is going on, going into, essentially, into fire, fire being gunshots or fire being whatever, and we can, they can do that. They also learned how to fight fires within this while this is going on. We worked on a partnership with that. Um, again, so we can put out a literal fire if something is still going on. Now, we have some considerations as we, as we talk about, like I said, the crime scenes. These are huge. They take time. They're not going to move fast enough for people. People are not going to get answers, and, that, and that's a consideration we have to have. Um, again, I talked about explosive devices. Those take time. The worst thing that happened, we got in a hurry and we set one off, causing more, more injuries and more deaths. Um, the evacuation part of it. As you see, you see on TV, they come out, people with hands up. There's a very reason why we do this systematic evacua evacuation, because now uh, the perpetrators are blending in. We've seen that happen. And so we don't want them to get back out and give them another opportunity to go on. So we have to take it very systematically. And then the reunification, getting people back to their loved ones. You know, again, I talked about people scattering, going all directions. This is going to be a major project. So we're going to have to rely on, again, a, a lot of partners to do this. Um, one I, I missed here is emergency management is going to come in. We're going to have to have the incident command system, and we're going to have to set this up and, and use a lot of resources to do all these things. Now, one big partnership we have as we talk about school, school shootings or school aggression is our, our partners with the school district, and obviously we actually have one of our partners here tonight from the school district. This is how important our partnership is. Now, we've had our school resource officers for a while. Now, I, I, you've heard me say that at school resource officers are social workers with guns. This is why they have the guns. Because they're, the, they're in the schools. They can be the quickest response to things that an active aggressor. Uh, they also do a lot of things working with the partnership with the school with the ears, the, hear something, say something, picking it up. Um, recent events where we had a subject that actually posted on social media that he was going to go shoot up a school. You know, he said it was a joke. You know, there's no joking about this. This isn't funny. None of that. But our school resource officers work that. They'll work, they don't work outside the school hours. They'll work late into the night so that they, this is taken care of before the next day. Again, working with our partners with the school. Communication um, is so key with that. And we communicate excellently with our Dubuque Community Schools. We also communicate excellently with, our, with the Holy Family. We, we keep, keep that school system in. Our response doesn't change for where this is at. We just happen to have a contract that have, has school resource officers in the Dubuque Community School District. We don't have it in the Holy Family part of that. But our response does not change in how we do that. Part of our training, and we've developed this into our training aspect, is that we train in the, in the schools itself. Uh, that's part of what we do. Uh, we encourage our officers to go out. We actually have maps of each school. We encourage our officers to go out and tour the schools. You know, some of these schools are pretty complex. <laughs> You're trying to go around them and trying to figure them out. Um, we try to get the officers as fast as they can uh, to figure out where things are going on and by, by again, having a little pre-planning or by having been there before to have an idea what that looks like. And we, we do that every summer on that. The prevention part of it. When things don't happen, honestly, we all get complacent. Things happen with complacent, complacency. But we want to have people, if they hear something, to say something. Let us know about it. We'd rather run it down and it be nothing than it actually end up being something. And so we, it, it takes everybody um, to do this. Again, our schools are great. They pass the information on to us, and, and we start working it in conjunction with them, and we, we're able to do that. But... Uh, we can't just chalk things up anymore. It's just, oh, that's weird or that's so-and-so. We have to really look at things and look at it and run it down and see what happens with it. Uh, again, that's, we can't prevent everything, but we want to prevent as much as we can, and that's the idea behind that. Uh, the fact is simple. I mean, we're seeing a lot of violence, um, 
particularly against our youth and by our youth. And, um, and I don't, there's not a singular answer to any of that. And it's going to take all of us to, to look to solutions to this. Uh, but again, um, I want you all to know and, the, and our citizens to know that we are prepared and, and we, have an, we have a plan, we, we work that plan, and we're, we're training that plan, and we're constantly evolving that plan so that, you know, as things are, are changing in the world, that we're trying to stay as best prepared as we can through that. So, thank you. Great. Thank you very much for your presentation. Any uh, questions or comments? Yes, Ms. Wethel. Um, I had personally contacted the city manager requesting that we have update on this simply. Um, after Uvalde, I think there's many unanswered questions about what we can do, what we can do better. Um, my background is cardiothoracic surgery. And when you get called in at two o'clock in the morning, you have two things. You have the people that you work side by side with and you have your training. That's it. Because yep. you don't know what's gonna happen next. And I don't have any claim to understand what it would be like to respond um, in the way that you do to gun violence, but I appreciate so much the people are collaborating that need to collaborate. Um, and of course, just the steadiness and continued training that you do, so thank you. Thank you. All right, again, thank you very Mr. much. Mr. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, I'm sorry. Yes, that's all right. Uh, Mr. Mayor, go right ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. I um, First of all, thank you, Chief Jensen, for this. I uh, very much appreciate this um, report and especially making this public to, to let the, the entire city know that we do have a plan and that you are training for this and you are partnering with everybody that you need to partner with to make sure that we do have a response. Um, obviously, the fact that we need a response like this is tragic, and um, we would much rather be able to solve this problem by not letting it happen. And to that point, I, uh, I just wanted to point out, um, you know, I'm, those of you at the table know this, but I'm not sure everybody does. I'm actually at the U.S. Conference of Mayors annual meeting this weekend for the last four days. I um, spent a solid four days going to uh, um, all kinds of different sessions on lots of different topics that I'll mention later, but this topic came up every single day every mayor in the country and every city in the country is talking about this right now um we have you know when you're here there's there's mayors from the largest cities in the united states down to the smallest and um, everyone is talking about it to the point where uh, today unanimously the entire conference passed a resolution that was entitled enough is enough congress must act now and it outlines demands from the u.s conference of mayors to start dealing with this problem and changing our society for the better. So I just wanted to point that out to, to let us know that we're not in, we're not alone in this. Um, we are, you know, obviously uh, dealing with the same problems that everybody else in the United States is dealing with. Um, but I also think that it's uh, important for us to point out that we're working on solving this problem upstream and not just dealing with the effects of it. So thank you for all the work that you do always in the police department and beyond. So thank you, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. All right. Again, uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. And thank you for your presentation. Uh, I know I used to go around the schools all the time to go in and uh, check for, uh, you know, instruments, you know, try out on band instruments and uh, security is pretty good, you know, and I've been there and they they didn't let me in just because I was a pleasant person with a smile. You know, they had they had their things they had to go through. But when these things happen, it's not the school's fault. They're great partners, and it's not your fault. We know what the situation is. And we appreciate you trying to make things better. As Mr. Rogers said, yes, there is a problem, and there's a tragedy. But look at all those people trying to help people. That's what we need to concentrate on. You're one of those people. The schools are on it, and our whole emergency team is is on that, and on that side of helping people as much as they can. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Um, Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you. Do we need to take a vote on that? Yep. Well, let's, vote on the let's motion. Let's do that. If you would, call the roll. Resnick. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Farber. Aye. And that motion, motion passes. motion passes six to zero. Thank you. 
Action item number two is Greater Dubuque Development Corporation quarterly update. Do we have a motion? Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Yes, Mr. Sell. I move to receive and file and listen to the fantastic presentation. Second by Sprank. Second by Sprank. So we have a motion and a second. And Mr. Dickinson, thank you. It's been a long night, but uh, it's going to be all worth it right now. Well, uh, my comments uh, pale to the very serious discussion you just heard from the chief. And thank you, uh, Council, for being on top of that uh, critical subject. Uh, my name is Rick Dickinson. I have the pleasure of serving as the president of Greater Dubuque Development Corporation. And as a condition of our, um, our agreement with the city of Dubuque, I'm here to give a quarterly update. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Mayor, um, remotely. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Resnick, uh, thank you ladies and gentlemen of the council for the opportunity to be here and also uh, City Manager Mike Van Milligan and your most excellent staff. Uh, I'm going to quickly go through some bullet points that have occurred in the last, in the last uh, 90 days and uh, be glad to answer any questions after that if you have the energy to do so. <laughs> um, on March 31st, we were proud to launch the You Can Be Great Here campaign, which is the capital campaign to fund Greater Dubuque Development Corporation for the next five years. Uh, Mayor Cavanaugh, uh, Tim Hodge, the current chair of Greater Dubuque Development Corporation, Supervisor Ann McDonough, Alex Dixon, CEO of, uh, of uh, the, uh, D the Q, uh, uh, Wendy Rundy uh, uh, from the Diamond Joe, Joe Hearn, President and uh, of uh, DuPaco and uh, vice, uh, vice President of Greater Dubuque Development Corporation joined us and we announced that we had to date raised $9,416,000 towards our goal of $11 million. But what is that $11 million for the next five years to, uh, intended to do? Is to reach these five goals. One, have 64,000 jobs by April of 2027. That's a daunting task because currently, April of 2022, we have 59,000 people working in the MSA of Dubuque County, so an increase of 5,000. Goal number two, increase the population of Dubuque County to 105,000. Currently, there are 99,266 residents in Dubuque County according to the 2020 census. 6% growth in that 10-year period. Zero growth in Dubuque. Let me repeat that. In the last 10 years, from 2010 to 2020, 100% of the population growth in Dubuque County occurred outside of the city limits of the city of Dubuque. Think about that. We want to increase construction in our community, communities in Dubuque County by $1 billion in both commercial, industrial, but majority in residential development. The proposal before you today would have accounted for approximately 4% of that daunting goal of achieving housing and commercial and industrial development. Number two, accessdubuquejobs.com. A unique, a unique partnership between Greater Dubuque Development Corporation and the uh, TH Media folks. Uh, I'm pleased to announce that we're expanding that to include the other communities in the tri-state area. So we now have AccessDyersvilleJobs.com, Access Farley, Access Piasta, Access Epworth, Joe Davies County, Grant County, in an attempt to bring more people into the labor pool, which is critical for us to be successful. Now, when you go to that site and you go to farleyjobs.com, accessfarleyjobs.com, it will take you to the jobs first that are posted in, in Farley, Iowa. But all the information for the tri-state area will be included there. It's just an attempt to have it be more broadly accepted and utilized by all concerned. Number three, last Thursday and Friday, we uh, entertained college career development folks from over 20 institutions for a 200 mile radius around Dubuque to show them the beauty of our city and to try to convince them to recommend jobs in the greater Dubuque area to their students. 
These 35 individuals representing 20, 20 institutions of higher learning represent 70,000 students that we want to consider Dubuque as a place where they can be great. Number four, Workforce Solutions Breakfast. Last Friday, we entertained over 200 HR professionals in our community, and we discussed with them the improvements we've made to accessdubuquejobs.com, including a $100,000 rebuild to have it be the most efficient public-private partnership job posting site in the country. Number five, we launched Work That Works, soliciting support from employers and from colleges for part-time work for our college students. Work that the employer will, will modify their schedule in order to accommodate the needs of the student, and work that the college will accommodate the student and the curriculum and so, and so that they can afford to go to school. We see this, this as a mechanism once it's robust enough to actually allow institutions of higher learning to recruit that first generation student or that low and moderate income student uh, to the Greater Dubuque area, which is a community of colleges. Not a community college. Dubuque is a community of colleges. And the program is called Work That Works. You'll be hearing more about that as we go forward. Number six, 4.0 Workforce Initiative Grant. That's a state grant. 13% of the award for that grant came to businesses in Dubuque County. IMCO, Dubuque Stamp, Inventory Trading, Clower Manufacturer, Premier Tool, ProPulse. We are 3% of the population of the state of Iowa and 13% of the awards came to industry in our community. And that's because of the partnership that Greater Dubuque Development has with these, these employers. And when we know that there's money available, we inform them and re we encourage them to make application and they did and they won. Number seven, distinctly Dubuque. We uh, will have four classes uh, this year. We're pleased to have the first class again after a two-year moratorium because of the pandemic. These are classes, in fact, you had two folks here today that talked about their experience of uh, distinctively Dubuque. Uh, your your uh, new chief of police had a tour, Nelson Clavitter, and loved that tour, and I think in many ways loved this community as a result of that tour. And I forget who the other one was, but uh, know that it's impactful. Over 120 folks take this class in one year's time, uh, and they, they meet other newcomers, develop relationships, and they have a tremendous tour of our community. Eight, access to BukeJobs.com College Career and Professional Development Fair. This was held earlier in, our court, in this quarter. Over 200 students were present with over 70 employers there to encourage them to seek opportunities at their places of employment. Number nine, Talent Dubuque Intern Experience. Um, that is, uh, we, co we contract with NICC to provide that service. Uh, we invite interns from across the community to meet each other, have learning events and social events, so these interns can have a better opportunity to consider Dubuque as their place uh, where they can be great upon graduation from college. And last, uh, annual meeting. Our annual meeting will be on July 21st at Steeple Square. Uh, we will invite all the mayor and council members, city manager and your staff to join us. We will be announcing where we're at uh, and, and trying to work toward that goal of $11 million for the You Can Be Great Here Great campaign. And I'll close up with that because I know the night is long and I'd be glad to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Do we have some questions? Uh, well, Rick, I, I, I was able to, um, I spoke uh, as a mayor pro tem at the mayor's um, breakfast here on Friday, and, we're, you know, and uh, it was great to have your event going at the same time, but when the, we were discussing workforce, and I just rattled off all the different things that the GDDC was doing, uh, access to .jobs, uh, com, pardon me, uh, data analytics and prospect development, Newcomer Services, Distinctly Dubuque, Dubuque Works, Home Base Iowa, Data and Resources, Inclusive Dubuque, and a really highlighted Opportunity Dubuque. That's a ton of stuff. And we're just so pleased that you are a partner, your group, uh, trying so hard to, uh, and succeeding, bringing people in. I love the, I love the lofty goal uh, that, that we have. I did mention that um, already Iowa is seventh in the nation with the, um, that, that we have, uh, you know, we have like 50 or 67, I have to forget, oh, 67% of our labor force are, is involved in, in, they're working. 
and we need to, and we're trying to get more people here um, from here, but let's bring in some good people. That's, I know that companies are always trying to do that. And I also mentioned that we have um, child care initiative is very important to you and to, to the important to the entire area, especially those gaps that aren't usually talked about or a lot. Well, they're not, they're just tough. The new infant or early or late shift drop in care. You're very familiar with all that. Sure. So um, do you have anything to shed some light on, on, on those type of things, uh, child care uh, things that are happening in that in that venue. Well, first of all, when I went through our, our goals for the next five years, I, I failed to mention the most important one, in, in my view, and that is to reduce poverty in this community by five percent. Uh, you know, this community has been very prosperous in the last uh, ten to fifteen years, despite the odds. Uh, but not everyone has enjoyed in that prosperity, and I think a community of choice uh, needs to focus on making sure that there's broad-based prosperity in our community. Um, I did note that the mayor's meeting uh, was the same day as our, uh, as our workforce breakfast, and, and I think that's unfortunate uh, because I think the citizens should have had an opportunity to witness both, which I think is testimony to maybe we should have a better, uh, uh, better resource and community calendar uh, reference. Uh, but, but I did note with the, the newspaper article about the governor or the mayor's meetings uh, that their focus was on housing, uh, on population, on child care, uh, and, and those certainly are, are uh, paramount in, the, in our mission. You know, uh, I understand as well as anyone who is not currently in public office how difficult governing is. Um, and, and there's no way to satisfy everyone. And um, what the, the common denominator for me on how we make decisions is what's, what's where's the greater good? Um, I think we have some daunting challenges in the next five years. Rural America is in trouble. Um, there is discussion with runaway inflation, the possibility of recession, and only the strong will survive and prosper. I think we must be bold in addressing the goals that are identified by the Board of Directors of Greater Dubuque Development Co Corporation. Bold in increasing the number of job opportunities in our community, especially those that provide a quality of life where someone could afford a home. Bold in increasing the population of our community. Bold in investing in our community in property, land, homes, both single family residences and rental properties. Bold in addressing the issues of poverty and hopefully at some point home ownership so that families can generate wealth for that family that can be passed down from generation to generation and destroy the vicious cycle of poverty. And in doing each and every one of these goals, we won't be able to keep everybody happy. There will be disappointments and there will be challenges. But bold we must be or we will never achieve these goals, ever. Thank you. And thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, could we please uh, call the roll? Resnick? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Farber? Aye. Passes six to zero. Action item number three is five flags referendum. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Yes. <laughs> so. I move to receive and file and adopt the resolution. Okay. Second by Kavanaugh. Second by Kavanaugh. Thank you very much. We have a motion and a second. Uh, Mr. Van Milgen. This memo Actually, came this from is me. Krenis, so. All right. Very good. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. 
It's very short. Um, per the last direction from the council related to the Five Flags referendum, what I did was I attached an updated resolution setting the vote date for March 7th of 2023, and the amount was adjusted to account for what the consultant uh, said the difference would be between now and then. I don't remember the percentage exactly, but I had someone smarter than me do the math to make sure that the number was correct. So that is the resolution that you have for your review and consideration tonight. All right. Thank you very much. Um, any comments or questions from the council? Mr. Cavanaugh, do you have a, a, any comments or question? Um, I do. Thank you. Uh, so in the time between the last time we discussed this at, uh, at the council table and um, now, we've, uh, first of all, kind of thank you very much for you and your office uh, for putting this together and doing the work you needed to do to get this back before us. But, um, you know, we've we've had some time to talk to the community. We've had some time to gather more information. Um, you know, we received some recent communication in the last couple of days from the city manager um, regarding what this would do to our debt. And I would love to hear from um, from Mike about that, uh, because I know that's information you shared with us. And I do think it's important that we discuss that publicly and then we can uh, talk a little bit more about that. Okay, thank you. Mr. Van Milligan? Yes, uh, thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. Um, so I did have some uh, council ask me questions related to the debt burden of the city. And um, you'll remember that the city just did issue some debt. And when we did that, Moody's, who provides bond ratings for communities when they issue debt so that then people that want to buy the debt know what level of risk they're taking based on a community's bond rating. And so uh, based on the questions I received, I uh, talked to our bond advisor um, about the basically the two questions, which were if this referendum were to pass and what we used at the, the time was uh, 94 million. So that's a little off from the 92.4 that the council is talking about putting in there, but it's, it's in the order of magnitude. Um, that, um, so what, what level of, uh, of our statutory debt limit would the city be using if that were to pass? And then would that in any way have the potential that the city at, based on that level of debt, debt might get a bond rating downgrade? And so this is the answer from Tiana Pooler, who's the president of the, uh, consulting firm we use when we issue bonds. She says, uh, based on debt as of the 2022 AB official statement, so that's debt we've already issued, uh, our uh, use of our debt capacity, statutory debt limit was about 50%. Um, this was the amount presented to Moody's who indicated in their report that, and this is a quote, significant increase in the debt or pension burden, uh, close quote, could lead to a downgrade. Um, increasing the, uh, and then this continues in the response from Tiana Pooler, increasing the May 1st, 2022 figure by the estimated five flags debt of, as I mentioned, 94 million is the number she used and reducing debt by $7.1 million paid as of June 1st, which is what is gonna happen, uh, where this has nothing to do with that referendum, it's just as, a, as the city retires some of its debt. Um, Tiana said she arrived at an estimated 86% uh, of the statutory debt limit would be in use should this referendum pass. Um, now she gives some caveats. She says, this does not incorporate anything related to future capital improvement program budgets. So she's not projecting any use of future debt. Um, and then she says, I think it is reasonable to conclude that this project would greatly restrict your legal capacity for future borrowings and likely negative impact your credit rating. So that's the opinion of our bond consultant. Thank you, Mike, for reading that for us. So, um, you know, I've I've been clear in supporting this uh, up to this point and um, saying that, you know, it's in our most recent vote, I voted to move this forward and, and move forward with the referendum. 
Uh, I think it's important, though, that when new information comes to light and we learn more as we go and um, we get some more time to get feedback from the public, uh, that we do change course if need be. And uh, my input that I've received from quite a few people, um, no science, it's not a scientific poll by any means, but from quite a few people has not been positive about moving forward with the question at hand at the, the 92 plus million mark. And given the fact that we now know the calculation that Mike just pointed out there about um, you know, 86% of our statutory debt, it leaves us with almost no wiggle room to do any of the other big things that we're really talking about. And that concerns me. And I think um, you know, at this point, what I would actually suggest, and I would love to hear um, all the rest of your thoughts on this, is that we, um, we don't move forward with this right now. We ask city staff to look at scenario three, um, specifically what the updated costs would be, and then what uh, that would mean for our debt limit those two specific questions, uh, because I think that um, this is just simply, it's, it's simply just gotten to be too much. And I cannot imagine this moving forward at this point. I think we need to look and see what our other options are. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Yes, Ms. Uh, Mike. Um, Farber. This 86.7%, which is the increase from the 50%, Point one one that the spreadsheet shows. Have we ever had an 86% um, use of our debt and or do you recall what the highest percent has ever been since you've been our manager? Uh, yes, I don't have the number in front of me, but I think we were at about 90% of our statutory debt limit in uh, 2015 when the 90. mayor and city council adopted the debt reduction strategy. 90%? Yes. And so we've been slowly chipping away at that over the years. And two things chip away at it. Each year we've been issuing less debt than we retire. And the assessed valuation of our community is growing. And your statutory debt limit is, is, is set at 5% of your community's assessed valuation. You cannot borrow more than that. So as your assessed valuation grows, that can bring your percent down, but also we've been issuing less debt each year than we retire. So our, uh, also our debt burden has been going down. And so that's how we've gotten to 50%. As a matter of fact, next year, FY23, we're projected to be, I think, 46%. Right. So basically what you're saying is that we've got ladders going in both directions here, depending upon whether or not we're issuing debt or retiring debt. Yes. Just for that correct. definition. Yes. Um, Okay, so 86.7 or 07 is probably going to really change our Moody's rating from that nice AAA that we have now. Yeah, uh, and we're actually not at AAA, but we are at a very enviable level. It's AAA or whatever it's called. Yes, yeah, and, right. and yes, so the Moody's report that we just did when we issued debt made the statement that Tiana Pooler pointed out right. that uh, a significant additional amounts of debt could uh cause our bond rating to be lowered. You, you might remember that at one time, uh, well, so we had a higher bond rating at one time and we, it was lowered. Um, and that was around the 2015 15. period where the council decided to adopt the debt reduction strategy. I don't remember exactly what year, but it was sure. right around then. Does this impact our reserves at all? Um, no. So we have a very enviable operating reserve of twenty over 22%, uh, over $17 million. So no, that it doesn't just impact Just in case that. of an emergency, et cetera. So uh, just in case that there's an, um, an emergency situation or something that we just don't plan for. I just want to make sure we still had funding there. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Yes, Ms. Roussel. <laughs> Mike, a question. Um, is it possible that we could use ARPA money to reduce the total amount to make it in the more reasonable? Well, I, I guess everybody will have their own definition of reasonable. <laughs> so in my definition, I'll say no, because um, you've designated all of our ARPA money for other purposes. And yes, we got about, I think it was 27 and a half million in ARPA money. 
Um, so you would have to start chipping away at those other purposes and saying, okay, those are all these things we're not going to do, like a rehabilitate, rehabilitate a lot of the park systems that we were going to do and uh, cover some of the sanitary sewer needs that we have and help get fiber optics across our community in partnerships with the, the two to two companies who have decided to provide fiber to every home and business in town. Um, and so uh, you could chip away at those things. And so you just would have to decide how far chipping away at those becomes the term you use, reasonable amount of, of uh, referendum debt to ask for. That answers my question. Thank you. And, and then I have one question for Krenna. Can you remind us on timing um, in order to meet the March deadline, a decision needs to be made by what date? So it's approximately January 19th or 20th. It's 46 days prior to the election. Mm -hmm. I always err on the side of adding an extra day or two to make sure that we meet it. So I think that puts us at about okay. January 19th. Thank you. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Mr. Sprank. Um, I, I agree with a lot of what with what the mayor said about go, looking at option C, which was the little lower option. Um, I guess we have to, uh, I guess we would theoretically, Krenna, we'd have to theoretically table this. It, so I guess if we wanted to theoretically table this, we'd have to motion it and then ask for staff to. You wouldn't find. have. You wouldn't have to table it. You could amend the motion to receive and file and refer to staff with direction. Okay, okay. You don't have to do anything with this resolution tonight if you don't want to. You can just change the action. Okay. I'm just thinking cost-wise, I mean, the, uh, and Marie might be able to answer the question better. We're, we're gonna have to pay the consultant again to, to update the numbers. So then we'll know, okay, so if option C used to cost 50 some thousand, 50 some million, it's gonna now cost whatever the new number is. Um, so that's gonna cost, and that's probably gonna take like another two months. So I'm trying to work with Laura's idea of the timeline here. It's like, okay, so if we had, say to, t to say three months, is that enough time to find out how much, how much it's gonna cost to find out what the potential new option is and to still keep this in the March deadline? Is, does that seem acceptable to others? I think that'd be kind of a good way to go. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem? Uh, yes, so, uh, Mayor Brad Kavanaugh, please. Yeah, I guess, um, yeah, I, I should chime in that, yeah, that's acceptable. I think I like the idea of asking staff for direction and looking at this third scenario um, to see what the, those numbers are. So we have um, some more information on that. Um, I, I would point out though that, I mean, the March deadline is, it's only a deadline because that's the date we chose. You know, we don't really have a deadline on this. Uh, we, we, can, we can do this in whatever time it takes to get it right. And I think that's important. Uh, I know that we've had a sense of urgency to move because we have had this sitting on the table for so long. But at the same time, uh, I don't want to put something before the voters that, you know, we kind of, we, we were right up on the deadline here. I don't want to put something before voters without the best information. So I... I I'm glad that we got the information we did by tonight so that we can continue this discussion in a way that works. But I think if we don't make a March referendum date, that's not the worst thing in the world. I think what we need to figure out right now is what are the real options on the table realistically uh, before we set a referendum. Thank you. Uh, yes, Ms. Wethel. I read this this afternoon and it completely changed my mind. Mm -hmm. And I promised voters when I recently ran for election that I would vote to put this to referendum, but I can't in good conscience do that. Um, I would even be uh, in favor of staff considering minimal maintenance option for now. And I do that because I have great concern about our economy moving forward. I think that we all need to be cognizant of what those options differences are and how much we want to invest now versus create a more specific plan for later. And it's an opportunity to look at that now and to reassess. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So um, I have been an advocate for scenario number two for a long time. 
And right now, scenario two is up to about $40 million if you take the, the price up. And uh, you know, Mr. Pregler mentioned $40 million. Um, again, we have talked to a lot of people. And um, one thing I'm, you know, I've been talking about this since 2015. We, we haven't really given, and I don't know how much guidance that we're supposed to give to our Five Flag Civic Commission. But they come to us um, with the great love for Five Flags and the great possibilities that can happen. We don't really give them any guidelines. We just said, just do what you think is, uh, is best. And um, then they come, you know, this um, ambitious plan. Uh, and they're excited about it. And we say we're going to put it up for a referendum because I said that as well when it was 74 million. Now it's 92. And but even as we mentioned before, uh, during the campaign, you talk to people and it's 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 a hard slog to get it up to uh, number four. Uh, and I again, I like scenario two with it, which I call a muscular update. And I mean, there is an option uh, number one, which is just we talked about uh, that you m mentioned, Ms. Wethel, which is uh, just simply take what we have and, and make some improvements. It's about $10 million is, is what we were looking at, you know, round numbers. Uh, scenario two is 40 million, and let's say 60 million and, and 92 million. And I would like it to pass because Five Flags is very important. I know when Miss Ware uh, came uh, to a budget committee once, and she said Five Flags is the soul of Dubuque. Now I don't know about that, but I know it's very important. Uh, and so I would like for Dubuque citizens to come together and say, "Yes, this is what we want for our Five Flags, which is very important to our community." So um, now, now here we are. I agree. Uh, in 90, I mean, we are 90% in in the in the hole here. Well, you know, our debt. Um, and then we said yes. We barely got to pass the council, but we got to pass the debt reduction plan has been working, and I appreciate the flexibility that our plan has had uh, over these years. So we have been able to uh, bond, and yet. We, uh, with clear, careful planning from Mr. Van Milligan and his team, to pay off more than we have uh, taken out in debt. So this would be if and only if, of course, that the we pass this our friend, we'd be up to 86% again. And then um, I'm pretty sure they gave she gave us a pretty clarion call to say. Uh, that's going to uh, affect our, our, our Moody's rating. We're going to get dinged pretty hard for this. But again, we didn't tell our commission that here's what we would like you to do. And um, so now we're in the end of the spot. So I, I, I guess um, I appreciate the, uh, the mayor's candor. And um, we talked about this last time. Uh, it was a 5-2 vote to, to go ahead. And so, as far as the commission is concerned, they think that we're going to, you know, this is just a formality. Uh, but here we are talking about nuts and bolts again. So I, I guess, uh, you know, if I'm if I'm wrong about uh, the nuts and bolts comment, uh, I'd be happy to, I mean, you know, get corrected. But I would like to know what is the best way to start so we can bring the community together and build on what is a very important. Uh, uh, what is very important to Dubuque citizens, that's the Five Flag Civic Center. How can we uh, make that better? So I, I'm still open to lots of other comments. My five minutes is up. I'm cutting myself off. Mm -hmm. okay. any, any other comments to help us move ahead, please? Mr. Mayor Portem, I agree. I think it's important to um, have a, a, a revisit um, and to make sure that we are collaborating with not only the business community and the Main Street community, but um, all citizens to, to come up with a solution that is workable, realistic, um, and that would pass a res referendum. Um, but I'm also quite cognizant of the 86% um, of our, t our burden here of our taxes. And I, I think on the bonding side that that's just a heavy lift. Um, based on my experience in working with a subsidiary of Moody's, I know it's an extremely heavy lift. 
uh, in order to um, present the credentials of the city on a basis to, to them for our rating. Um, and so it, this is a good time to kind of reflect, refresh, and, and see if the um, options for less dollars works and maybe it becomes more of a boutique um, opportunity uh, for the five flags uh, than, than this one that we have on the table. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any concrete proposals that we could turn into um, a motion uh, that might move us forward? Or do you have, um, I mean, you don't make motions, so, and, but you've all heard Mr. Van Milligan sometimes ask some great suggestions on how to word what he has heard from us tonight. But um, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor Proton. Yes, Mr. Mayor, I, yeah. I, I turn to you. What, what do you suggest? Yeah, so um, I know it was, I believe it was Ms. Rousseau who made the original motion. Yes. 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 Is, that, is that correct? Okay. Um, I, I, would, I would ask uh, Ms. Roussel if you would uh, possibly consider uh, amending the motion to um, ask for direction uh, specifically about the costs and debt burdens of scenarios three and two. Three and two. Well, before I do that, um, I'm, I'm very much on board with the with the caution of going to 86 percent and the the bond information <clears throat> is very clear um, but I, I want to remind us that there were reasons that we didn't choose those other options earlier mm -hmm. so if we do choose to look at them we need to revisit why didn't we pick this before there was a reason and so um, that would be something I would hope would be included in that so I would, I would change my motion to uh, say receive and file, and um, refer to staff. refer to staff. Can I leave it at that? Um, I would give further direction and 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 uh, review the uh, scenarios three and two, and perhaps well I'll leave it there. <laughs> I would second that motion. Is that a complete motion then in a second? Is, it, is there direction involved with that? I, I guess I would ask, is that enough for you, Mike? Yes. I'm going to ask Marie. Marie to step up. It sounds to me like it is, but Marie's been deeper in this than I have been. So The poor thing. <laughs> Somebody was really tall. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Marie Ware, Leisure Services Manager. Um, so we've been, uh, I had to look back to what's three and what's two. So I'm sitting back there going, okay, I came thinking you're on one track and you're all on a different track now. So um, I can do whatever you request. So I can ask the consultant to do both of those but to Councilperson Rousseau's comment, I do think it would be good before I do that and before you pay for that to actually go back. And even though we had a real long work session on this the one time, just have me focus on those two. And within um, one of the studies, it's like, why isn't three as good? And like to go back over that mm -hmm. so that like if you go through that and say, okay, only one of these seems logical to me as a group, then that's what we go and do. Or if you want, just yes. so that you have the most flexibility, we could do both. And you could tell me that now, just do both and bring them back. And at that time, we'll talk about the pros and cons of both of those and, and kind of what you get and what you give up is essentially what it is. Um, I almost hate to mention it, but the other side of the world that some cities do is they kind of pick their number, like I can only stomach this. And then they figure out kind of a general plan. So that kind of goes to it's one of your points of uh, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, of what's this dollar figure so that you give the commission and others this opportunity to figure out what fits within that and then give you those parameters. But that's almost starting back over because that's a whole nother. When you mentioned boutique, 
that's what that gets to. It's a whole nother scenario. And of course, everybody said we've studied it too much. So I bring that up just so that you think about that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because as staff, I can engage that consultant to do a lot of different things, but I want it to be of value to you um, and use our resources in the best way possible. Because there's a lot of people that already say we've already studied too much, right? Um, and so, uh, which, if you think about, uh, you know, to that, if you think about how much we've actually spent and how much we spend on an engineering project to get it ready to go, we haven't spent hardly anything on this comparatively. So uh, this is a big decision. You need to have all the right facts to be able to bring it to the voters, as well as, uh, if that's your choice, as well as give those voters the most accurate information. Um, and, and that way they, gonna, they know the pros and cons. They know what we gave up, they know what we got. Mr. Mr. Yeah, Marie, can you just remind me, when we went back to the to this consultant, what did we actually, what did they charge us to get that updated number? I knew Wasn't it right. like 20 or 20,000 ish 20, or 30,000? 20 to 30. Each okay. of them has cost a little bit different, so I didn't come prepared so to like bring Possibly that, 40 to 60,000 just to find out how much more our number, those yeah. two options have gone up. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Yes, Ms. Wetha. No, that's okay. Um, I really appreciate that new out of the box idea of considering now based on today's numbers, what is the amount of debt that we are willing to take on and then make a decision about how much we're willing to spend and we would like to evaluate what option might match that. Let's come at it from the, the complete backwards route because I, I think I am concerned that we will spend more money and then come up with a proposal that would also impact potentially our bond rating moving forward and we would have to say no again. And so maybe we should go back and discuss with independent public advisors what number we would be willing to take on. And Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, yes, uh, first, um, <clears throat> just a minute. I, I would like to say though that more importantly than our Moody's rating is really getting the community, to me, getting the community on board because they'd be willing if they said this is important and we we wrap, we, we have a five flags proposal that everybody can get around and they understand that that might affect things. Uh, but uh, I appreciate your comments, but I, I, again, uh, I like your way of um, talking about things. To me, it's really about what the community can really rally around and then they're okay with those kind of things as long as they know. Mr. F Mrs. Farber, please. Yeah, so I just wanted to uh, re refresh everybody's memory that we have some uh, funding sources and some business groups that independently created a study as a follow-up for encouragement and enthusiasm for the five flags. Uh, and that that is the group that is um, wholeheartedly supporting the new endeavor and looking to fundraise whether it is uh, in a donation or sponsorships um, to afford some some funding for this. So um, just that is just as an FYI. And then also maybe Mike uh, could ask um, Moody's or Jenny to come up with what we think is um, an acceptable percentage. I agree that it's important to have a, a range um, that we know that could um, keep us kind of where we are or change just our bond rating just a touch, but not significantly uh, for us moving forward. And I know that that's a cautionary tale, but it's important for us to have an idea of, of what that might be. Thank you. And I think when you say refer to staff, that would be part of the part of what you would do is uh, say this amount of debt would affect our, um, our overall debt uh, load by a certain amount. Well, potentially. Mr. Van Milligan, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, uh, I don't think we'll get a clear answer to that question. So um, one of the suggestions I really like that Marie made, and it's back to what the mayor said earlier, that we want to get this right. And um, based on 
the last time where the council members felt the majority, let's move ahead with 92 million. Um, what if we have a work session and we go through the different options and what the pros and cons were and that council can decide, okay, we want you to price two and three, or we just want you to price two, or we just want you to price three, or we just want you to price one. Um, I'm just concerned that maybe there's not enough information mm -hmm. uh, top of mind right now based on all these studies and this reports this thick. Would it, if, if the council would entertain having another work session to go over the pros and cons of the different options and then give us some fairly clear direction on, okay, here's what we want you to do, staff. We we'll refer this to you and here's what we want you to do. Because I'm just having a sense that right now I'm, I'm not sure it's that clear. Yeah, I agree. Uh, Mr. Mayor, do you have any comments? I completely agree with Mike, actually. Um, I think it's a good idea. Right. I know it's I going agree to with Marie. <laughs> I, I, I think it's going to be um, I'll just I'll speak frankly. I think people are going to be annoyed by this. Um, and I, you know, I, I think I kind of am, too. But here's the deal, too, is the fact that, um, you know, we have these discussions about maybe there's some extra money coming. Maybe there's other sponsorship opportunities, things like that. There's a pretty solid idea of what the sponsorship opportunities are. What we don't know at all is where how much any other money from any private citizen might actually be. We have no sense of that whatsoever. Um, so really, one of the things that I think is difficult for us here is that we're working on this on our own. I mean, it really and I haven't heard anybody, any groups from the, the city, um, you know, within our community really step up to say we're taking the lead on this. That was one of the things that um, kind of led me to this decision today to back away from this right now is that I'm not hearing that excitement from anybody else in the community. Nobody is stepping up and saying we're leading the charge on five flags. So we are we're really on our own here in a lot of ways um, with just suggestions and ideas from other people. So we, you know, I really do think we are back to, to work session phase on this one to be able to really get our heads around what is going forward. Um, we are entering a time where there are major economic concerns. I agree with Ms. Wethel on this. And we're also entering a time where borrowing is not going to be as attractive as it was in 2012 when we last went into debt at a high rate. There was a, there was a reason for that. And it was a smart move. I think I wasn't on the council, obviously, but I think it was a smart thing to do back then. It's not becoming as smart now because of the way that, um, rates are going. So I, I really do think it's time to just, to step back. So I would totally agree with, um, having a, another work session to see what we can wrap our heads around and then uh, see how we can move forward. Thank you very much for you, for, for your input, Mr. Mayor. Um, uh, yes, Ms. Roussel. Do I need to amend my motion? Yes, if All you right. would, please. So I'm going to move to receive and file and refer to staff for a work session. And is that good? And I will happily second that, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. All right, so uh, we do have a motion and a second. Does everybody understand it and would like to have some discussion? Mr. Van Milligan, please. I'm sorry. Uh, I was talking to Marie, so I'm not exactly sure what the motion was, but what I was talking to Marie about is when does she think she could be ready for a work session if that's what the council chose to do. So I don't know if that's what you chose to do or not. Right, and you. she said one of the meetings in July she could be ready awesome. for because it's really information we already have. We're not getting anything updated. We're just using what we got. Mm -hmm. um, but she still has put together, so I'm not <laughs> diminishing the effort that goes into that. Mm -hmm. But so... That's what you could do if you're going to do a work session. We do not need to have a date certain on this no, motion. It was, it was a, an amendment to um, receive and file and refer to staff to schedule a work session. Okay, well, how about if we go ahead and schedule it the second meeting in July? Mm -hmm. So that'd be the third Monday in July? I think it's the 20th. I mean, that'll cause us, as we have four or five requests on tonight's agenda, <laughs> that's one of the reasons I'm trying to get a date set, because there's a whole bunch of 18th. people wanting dates. Yeah. That would be July 18th. Right, you pick a non-city council meeting the night, the then you got a lot more flexibility. But What's the date? July 18th. Well, so, so if you want to do it on an off Monday in July, it would be the 11th or the 25th. If you wanted to do it the night of the second council meeting, that would be the 18th. 
I don't want to put the words in the mayor's mouth, but I think he wants a, a good, robust discussion about this, and so maybe we should go on an off night. Mr. Mayor, what do you think? Yes, I, I would agree that would work, um, and whatever would be best, the, I, I would vote for the best night for Marie on this one, I would say. Marie, are you available July 11th? That's an off Monday in July. So July 11th would work for staff. So it's, okay. but it doesn't have to be because I see some cringing going on. I'm just that's throwing a date out there. <laughs> that's that's the UD fundraiser that night. So we could, uh, but is the 25th all right as well, Miss Ware? And and uh, other council members, could you check the 25th, okay. July 25? That would be okay with me. We can make that. Number. I'll be out of town. Oh, so I'm it doesn't. Just, so it doesn't matter whether it's the 11th or the so 25th. The 11th, I can't, but I'm in Dubuque. Um, the 25th, I'm out of the country. So you can't participate in either one. I could call in. I'm well. I'm here physically on the 11th. I just have to scooch over from the UD outing. Okay. So it, it now it turns out that the 11th is probably better. Better than the 25th. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Mr. Mayor, how's that work for you? Sounds good to me. Thank you. If you could re-amend. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to amend my motion, and it will say, I would like to receive and file, refer to staff for a work session on July 11th. At what time? At a uh, second. Oh. At 6 p.m. Sure. Sure. All right. Second, second time. <laughs> All right. Thank you very much. So we have a, a motion and a second to refer to staff and we'll have a work session, uh, Five Flags work, work session on July, Monday, July 11th at 6 p.m. Um, any other observations or? OK, good. Let us, if we could, uh, take, take a roll call here. Resnick. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Farber. Aye. That passes six to zero. Action item number four is B Branch Stormwater Pumping Station, Station Project, phase five of the B Branch Watershed Flood Mitigation Project, reject bids. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, Mr. Sprank. Uh, with a heavy heart, I motion that we receive and file and adopt the resolution. I'll second. All right, so Ms. Roussel seconds. And uh, Mr. Van Milligan. Thank you. City Manager Mike Van Milligan. City Engineer Gus Sahoyas is recommending City Council adoption of the resolution rejecting the bids for the B Branch Stormwater Pumping Station project. In May of 2022, the City Council approved the estimated cost for the B Branch Stormwater Pumping Station project in the estimated amount of $15,790,000. Sealed bids for the B Branch Stumpwater Stormwater Pumping Station Project, Phase 5 of the B Branch Watershed Flood Mitigation Project, were received on May 19th. There were only two bids. The low bid was $24,650,000, 56% over the engineer's estimate. There are several factors that may have contributed to higher than expected construction costs. Some possible reasons are as follows. The timing of the bid letting. Bidding work for the upcoming construction season is typically better done in the preceding fall or winter. With a letting in the spring, contractors are more likely to have their work lined up for the coming construction season. Contractor backlog. It is currently difficult to find available contractors and subcontractors resulting in a bidder's market. Construction time frame. The U.S. Economic Development Administration grant required completion of the work by April of 2024. Condensing the construction schedule can lead to higher costs. And find our final reason that we believe is availability of construction materials. For a myriad of reasons, labor and material prices have been on the rise. In fact, suppliers are no longer guaranteeing their price quotes given at the time of the bid letting. As a result, contractors must hedge against material inflation costs. For example, the price of steel increased by 18% over a two-month period. 
and a contractor cannot lock in the price until the supplier begins manufacturing the contractor's order. The two bids received were within 1.4% of each other, suggesting that the bids reflect the true cost of the project if awarded today. Rebidding the project with the same design would likely result in similar results. Prior to bidding, the idea of granting more time to complete the improvements was discussed with the U.S. Economic Development Administration representatives. They indicated that the April 2024 deadline was a hard deadline. As a result, one of the downsides to rejecting the bids is that the city may lose the $2.5 million US EDA grant as the improvements will not be constructed by the grant imposed deadline. After taking the time to value engineer the current design, consider other design alternatives, and the city is prepared to move forward with a design, it will be in a position to again seek funding assistance or possibly a project phasing option might allow the city to use the EDA grant in the specified time frame. I concur with the recommendation and I respect the request mayor and city council approval to reject the bids. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any comments? Uh, Mr. Sprank. Yeah, a uh, quick question. Uh, Mike, uh, I understand why we had to do this because once again, work in construction, uh, been seeing all the same things. Why was the EDA so, f f why, why was there such a hard deadline? Don't they understand what's, go what's going on with things? Well, we have already, uh, Gus, can you come up here? I believe we already were granted one extension. Okay. Gus Sahoyas, city engineer. Yeah, we were granted an extension and uh, Terry Goodman and Darren Muring from our office has been in contact them constantly and they won't give us an extension and we've begged for it so they haven't had any luck. But. You know, we will go back and look for another grant if, you know, we reject the bids and go out and see if we can find some other alternatives, value engineering, like Mike said. I have one more question. What's the life expectancy of our current pump station? Like, what if that were to fail and now we have to do this? No, I, I don't really think that's a possibility. That's I mean, a problem, spend, I it? think it is old. It's like the 1950s or yeah, 60s. It's, it's, yeah, it's but like, we've maintained it. Okay. Um, but it, we want to increase the capacity. We do want to increase, we do want to replace it. Yes. But I, I don't think we're, there's any impending doom or anything. That, okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Yes, I, uh, I mean, I understand why I have to do this too. Um, so I'll, I'll vote to, to agree with this, but I am, I'm very concerned about the EDA grant. Uh, I know that that's frowned upon uh, from federal government agencies to <laughs> turn these, um, return these grants without using them. So if there's, I guess I would just hope, and, 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 I, and, I, and I trust that this is the case. I'm gonna say it out loud, but I trust that staff is doing this, that um, if there is any way to do this project in the phased format that was uh, described near the end of your memo there, to be able to utilize this grant without giving it back, um, I, uh, I would, I would really um, appreciate that. And um, I, I guess I would ask too. I'm, I'm sitting here looking at the chat because I'm looking at the screen, and I see that um, Terry Goodman is with us, and she actually says that she may have additional comments. Uh, Mr. Mayor Pertem, would it be okay if I ask her to to speak on this as well? Uh, I, I would give you wide leeway about that, Mr. Mayor. So absolutely. Ms. Goodman, do you have some comments that might be helpful for us? Please? She says she's muted. Okay, I'm I'm unmuted now. Thanks so much, Mayor and uh, Mayor Pro Tem. And uh, to Gus's comments, we have been working with Andy Seth in Washington, D.C., and uh, Darren and I have had a call with him, and we're going to have one more call with the regional EDA director and then also with uh, the deputy assistant secretary of the Department of Commerce because only that person can make this decision to give us an extension. So we are still trying to save the grant. And we agree with uh, the, those who have said there are extenuating circumstances and, and that have really contributed to the delay in this project. And, and much of it has to do with the current economy. Thank you very much for that information. 
Uh, yes, Mr. Sprank. One, one last question, I promise. All right, uh, last question. Can these funds be used on anything else related to the B Branch project, like green alleys? Yeah, I think not. Terry, okay. do you want to weigh in on that? No, unfortunately, Danny, I'd love to have that happen, but there are specific funds for this project. All right, thank you. And I want to thank you for um, rejecting this because sometimes the answer is no. I mean, we can't do it. I mean, it's too expensive. And um, and I I think that with our team, once we get it, um, we'll look at it again and get another shot at it. If we don't use these funds, we'll uh, give them a good reason to give us another grant. So thank you very much. Um, with that, if we could um, call the roll. Resnick. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Farber. Aye. Uh, vote is 6 0. Action item number five is appointment to Dubuque County Emergency Management Commission. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes, Ms. Farber. I move that we receive and file and approve the recommendation. Second. All right, <laughs> we have a motion and a second. Uh, Mr. Van Milligan. I don't, I think this is uh, where Mayor Kavanaugh is recommending that we appoint our new fire chief, Amy Scheller, to uh, the Emergency Management Commission. All right, so uh, do we have any questions or comment about that? Except I think she'd make a great representative. <laughs> uh, any other, would that would differ than that? All right, so and I'm sure Mr. Uh, the Mayor agrees since he made that uh, recommendation to start. So if we, if we could just call the roll. Resnick? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Farber? Aye. Uh, that's 6-0 in approval. Number six, please. Action item number six is work session request inclusive debut quarterly update. Uh, so everybody does uh, June 20 at 6 p.m. look good for everybody? We need a motion. That's what I meant to say. <laughs> Could I have a motion, please? I move to receive and file and set the, the work session for Monday, June 20th at 6 p.m. Second. second. We have a, a motion and a second. Um, let's just get right to the roll. Uh, if you can check your calendars, you already have probably. Um, Yes, call the roll, please, Ms. Reitfelder. Resnick? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Farber? Aye. That's six to zero. Action item number seven is work session request, workforce housing needs session number two. Mr. Mayor Person? Yes, Mr. Sprank. I motion that we receive and file and set the work session for Monday, August 1st, 2022 at 5.30 p.m. Second. And second by Roussel. And if you could call the roll. Resnick? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Farber? Aye. That passes six to zero. Action item number eight is work session request, historic building rehabilitation and preservation. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. I move that we receive and file and set the date for Monday, August 1st at 6 o'clock p.m. Second by Wethel. Second by Wethel. So we have a motion and a second. If you could call the roll, please. Resnick? Aye. Sprank? Aye. Wethel? Aye. Roussel? Aye. Kavanaugh? Aye. Farber? Aye. Vote is 6 to 0 in approval. Action item number 9 is work session request, Imagine Dubuque update. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Mr. Sprank. I motion that we receive and file and set the work session for Monday, August 15th, 2022 at uh, 6 p.m. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second uh, to approve that time and date of the work session. If you could uh, call the roll, please. Resnick. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Farber. That's six to zero in approval. Action item number 10 is delivering Dubuque video series episodes one and two. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Yes, Mr. Van Milligan. Thank you. Um, probably taking a little risk here, 
But due to the late hour and you still have close sessions, two close sessions tonight, maybe would we want to do 10 and 11 on the next city council agenda? It's, it's a total between the three videos of about 15 minutes. So moved. Yes. We can move. Well, I think that's a good idea. Would we would need, uh, would we table these? I, I would just motion to move them to the next meeting agenda. I see. That's why I would need a motion to do that. I will motion to move to the next agenda of the next council meeting. Second by Farber. So we have a motion and a second to uh, uh, move items 10 and 11 onto the next council agenda. Um, if you could call the roll, please. Resnick. Aye. Sprank. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Roussel. Kavanaugh. Aye. Farber. Aye. Thank you for that uh, suggestion. Okay, we have a closed session. We will first move on to council member reports. That's what I was going to do. So thank you. Uh, do we have some council member reports? We've got a, a, a preliminary report by our mayor. Uh, would you like to comment further, Mr. Mayor? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. I'll make this very, very quick, but I do think it's important to just publicly state it because um, this U.S. Conference of Mayors annual meeting is something that um, uh, our uh, previous mayor, Roy Buell, was an active member of the U.S. Conference, and he uh, one of the things he told me was make sure you keep going to these meetings. And I'm telling you, he wasn't um, he wasn't wrong. I've had some really amazing information come our way. I've already shared a bunch of it with the city manager. Uh, I've copied Terry Goodman on a lot of those emails. Um, we've talked about all kinds of things, best practices throughout the country, about some of the main things that we're talking about in Dubuque. Um, and as far as relationship building goes, this is a, it's a, it's a conference that's really unmatched. I mean, I've talked to people from the federal government from all over the country. It's uh, it, it's a very important meeting for the city of Dubuque. And, it, and it, just one more quick thing about that is I think that these types of events are really important for us to attend. I know that as mayor, I, I get these opportunities for this particular one, but I think the National League of Cities, Iowa League of Cities meetings, so things like that, that allow us to network. Um, are good for Dubuque. It's not as much about our professional um, skills and um, those types of things, but it's better for Dubuque to be represented in these things. So just wanted to mention that and thank you for giving me that time. All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you for your service to our citizens. Ms. Wethel. I have um, three brief things just to mention. Um, first, I had the privilege of doing a ride along with uh, police officer Jake Hudson on uh, Saturday, May 21st. and. Um, he is clearly an advocate for community policing. I felt very impressed with the integrity of each officer I encountered, and I'm very grateful for the opportunity and what they do. Um, second, I, uh, as a report off from my Dubuque Early Childhood Board meeting on May 25th, we are working on vaccine distribution to children, as well as focusing on distribution of resources to daycare providers uh, regionally. And then um, on June 4th, my family and I attended the opening of Franny's Barbecue on 1850 Central. And it is an incredible family venue. They have done an amazing job of updating existing property and breathing life into it. And I hope everyone will take the opportunity to go visit. Thank you. Thank you. You forgot to mention how delicious that was, though, too. It was great. It was great. Do we have other council member reports? All right, thank you very much. Now I believe we have a closed session. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, yes, Ms. Roussel. I move that we go into closed session um, related to Chapter 21.51C of the Code of Iowa to discuss pending um, real estate transaction. Just a point of order. In addition to um, pending litigation, it's also purchase or sale of real estate, which is uh, Chapter 21.5J of the Code of Iowa. Okay. <laughs> that. <laughs> Do we need a second? Yes. Second, second by Farber. Second by Wethel. She got in there. And for the record, the attorney of the, uh, the city council will consult with on the issues to be discussed in the closed session is City Attorney Karina Brownwell. So we are in. We just got to call the roll, roll. and then. Let's do that. Resnick. Aye. Frank. Aye. Wethel. Aye. Roussel. Aye. Kavanaugh. Aye. Farber. Aye. There we go. That's six to zero. We are in closed session. I just wanted to do that. <laughs> <laughs>